there will be now be an opportunity for silent prayer or meditation. Elona lowo as tanda zelengo take twaka as yaleze enkosiniak. Thank you very much. We may be seated. Uh, Honourable Acting Premier, Honourable Members of the Executive, our Chief Whip and Deputy, Deputy Chair of Chairs, Honourable Members that are present, Members in the Public Gallery, our HODs that are present here and those that are connected virtually, let me take this opportunity to formally recognize everybody who is part of this sitting today. I must also indicate, honored members, that uh, we are going to move uh, with bit speed, though there will be an hour for questions for oral reply. And members of the executive, because uh, you have already complied with all the standards of document uh, submissions, when you respond, just be informed that at least the members have received the responses that we have forwarded to the table. Are there any notices of motion? Let me start uh, with Honorable Deputy Chief Whip. Chief Whip. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Good afternoon to you and the members at large. Deputy Speaker, I move without notice in terms of Rule 130 that despite the provisions of the standing rules of procedure of the Eastern Cape Provincial Legislature, that the House approves the rearrangement of the order paper for the House plenary session of 11th October 2023 to now appear as follows, 1, 2, 3, 4, draft resolution by Honorable Kasim, draft resolution 2 will be Honorable Van Bochenrod, 3, will be Honorable Anil Kumar, four, and the last one will be Honorable Mbonyana. I so move. Thank you, Honorable Chief Whip. I put the motion. of police Begitele during Operation Chanel crack, crackdown against fake, fake goods uh, said South Africa had a problem with counterfeit goods and illegal foreigners who rented business premises to sell fake and food items and other, and other goods to South Africans. Therefore, I move that this house urges the Eastern Cape Department of Economic Development environmental affairs and tourism, municipalities and the relevant law enforcement agencies to strengthen efforts to enforce existing laws and regulations against counterfeit foods and illegal dumping. This should include increased surveillance, more severe penalties for, for offenders and better coordination between relevant authorities. 
urge the government to double its efforts and environmental health inspectors, even in our townships, uh, uh, to do monitoring uh, uh, of selling expired goods. Decisively deal with counterfeit goods that are a health hazard to consumers. Further address barriers to entry for smaller producers who want to enter the market legally but are excluded. Ultimately address food insecurities and poverty as these are the main drivers of consumer demand for cheap food. Calls for support and funding for comprehensive public awareness campaigns that educate residents of Eastern Cape Townships and rural areas about the dangers of counterfeit, expired and illegal dumping encourages the allocation of resources for the development and maintenance of waste collection and disposal in, uh, of infrastructure within Eastern Cape Township. Adequate and accessible waste disposal facilities will encourage illegal dumping by providing convenient alternatives. Emphasizes the importance of facilitating community involvement in combating illegal dumping through initiatives such as community clean clean-up drives, uh, neighborhood watch programs, and educational workshops. Empowering residents to take ownership of their environment is vital to achieving a lasting solution. Impress upon government to establish partnerships with non-governmental organizations, community-based organizations, and other stakeholders to pool resources, expertise, and knowledge in addressing expired and counterfeit food call for the implementation of a robust system for monitoring and reporting and making it easier for residents to report incidents and authorities to report promptly. I so move, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Chief Whip. Uh, can I get clarity? Is this a notice of motion? Yeah, it's a without motion without notice. Thank you very much. I put the motion out, members. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Mkhaka. Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Acting Premier, Honorable Chief Whip, and members of the Executive Council, and the rest of the House. A motion relates to pledging solidarity with the people of Palestine. Honorable Speaker, I move a notice of motion in terms of Rule 131 of the standing rules of the Eastern Cape Provincial Legislature, that this House note the eruption of conflict between Israel and Hamas on the 7th of October, 2023. Recognize that the long history behind this conflict that has caused untold suffering by the Palestinians for, de for decades. Note that the violence and loss of innocent lives in Gaza have deeply saddened us. Recognize the suffering and hardship endured by the Palestinian people who yearn for the same rights and freedoms enjoyed by others in the region. Affirm that it is our collective duty as peace-loving people and representative of our constituents to advocate for a just and lasting solution to this protracted conflict. Note that Palestinians are currently experiencing 75 years of ethnic cleansing, 15 years of Israelite blockade, annexation of Palestinian land, bombing of Palestinian towns, desecration of Palestinian sacred sites, daily raids into Palestinian homes, constant humiliation and harassment of the entire people. Be saddened by the arrogant stance adopted by Israel government ever since the illegal occupation of the Palestinian land. Condemn the continuous illegal occupation of Palestinian land and the continuation of harassment, raping of women, abusing of children, kidnapping, destroying of houses and infrastructure, inflicting pain to ordinary people, which, are, which is currently happening. 
Further note that the provocation of this just war has exposed the inconsistency of the United Nations for its failure to implement its own resolution on Palestinian question, thus exposing hypocrisy and inconsistency of US-led NATO countries in relation to Israel-Palestine as against Russia-Ukraine proxy war. Therefore, resolves as follows. We, the members of the Eastern Cape Legislature, stand united in our unwavering commitment to the principles of justice, peace, and human rights. We call for an end of the annexation of the Palestinian land and condemn the action of apartheid Israel. In light of the recent unprecedented attacks on Gaza and Palestinians, we believe it is imperative for all institutions express its solidarity with the people of Palestine and to call for a peaceful resolution to the ongoing conflict. This legislature expresses its heartfelt condolences to the families of those who have lost their lives or have been injured in the recent attacks in Gaza and throughout the Palestinian territories. We call upon all parties involved in the Israel-Palestinian conflict to immediately cease hostilities and engage in meaningful dialogue to find a peaceful and lasting solution. Condemn once more the arrogant stance adopted by Israel government for illegal occupation of Palestinian land. Condemn the disgusting, horrendous, heinous, and atrocious activities against Palestinians in the land of their birth your West Bank, your Gaza, etc. Reject and condemn the pain of frustration orchestrated by Israel government for the past 75 years. Condemn the biasness of the United Nations in favor of Israel to further delay the Palestinian resolution. Call upon UN member states to force the United Nations to implement the original UN resolution in order to stop the war. Condemn the hypocrisy of USA-led NATO in ideological stance against the Palestinian people and call for, once again, the African Union to intervene to save lives. Affirm the Palestinian people have got the right to defend themselves against aggressors. We emphasize that the responsibility of, for the violence and suffering in this conflict land squarely on the oppressors and we affirm that the ability to end violence and achieve lasting peace is within their hands. No people will willingly stop resistance when they are not free. We urge our government to work with the international community and relevant stakeholders to facilitate negotiations and lead to a peaceful, fair solution where Israelis and Palestinians coexist peacefully within secure and recognized borders. The legislature reaffirms its commitment to the principle of human rights, international law, and justice, and calls for the protection of the rights and dignity of all Palestinians and Israelites. We encourage our government to provide humanitarian aid and support to alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people affected by the recent violence and to assist the reconstruction of essential infrastructure in Gaza. We commit to engaging in open and constructive discussion with our party and the legislature to contribute to a better understanding of the complexities of this conflict to seek solutions that promote peace, stability in the region. Call on the South African government to consider closing down the Israel embassy to practically give support to Palestinian people as a matter of urgency. In adopting this motion, we affirm our unwavering support to the people of Palestine and our commitment to a just and lasting peace in the Middle East. Aluta, continue. Thank you, honored member. Uh, the motion is noted and it will be then debated at a later stage in accordance uh, with Rule 133, subsection 1. Uh, Honorable Malam Lela. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Honorable Deputy Speaker, I move without notice in terms of Rule 130 that the House observe that Mdanzane's Uluaz High School scooped the top national award and received a top accolade at the Department of Education's Excellent Awards held in Johannesburg on Friday. Note that the school was also recognized as the second best Quandal Three school in the country. The award is in recognition of the school showing consistent performance in obtaining 100% in metric results from 2013 to 2022. Also note that Uluaz principal Mihlali Makalima said he was honored and proud of the recognition that the school received on the national stage and also said that, I quote, it is a reflection of the hard working and dedicated team we have at the school. My team and I have a mission of serving this community and changing the lives of the destitute. Impress upon educators to be selfless and committed in teaching and researching by utilizing their time productively in order to obtain sustainable metric results outcomes throughout the province. Recognize that rural and township schools can perform and do wonders if they have good systems and supported by both parents and the Department of Education. We therefore call upon the Department of Education to, to spare no effort in supporting high school performing such as these and those that are still struggling. I so move, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Malam Lela. I put the motion, Honorable Members. Thank you very much, Honorable Botha. Honorable Deputy Speaker, thank you. I hereby give notice that I will move in terms of Rule 1311 of the standing rules of this House, noting, one, that our province is facing worsening cost of living crisis that is leading to such desperate poverty and despair that people are allegedly taking the lives of their children to save them from starving to death. Two, that the tragedy that struck the Tolani administrative area in Butterworth in August this year, where a mother allegedly poisoned her three youth children before taking her life, apparently motivated by extreme poverty, uh, should never happen in this province. Three, that last month a young mother from Port St. John's allegedly killed three of her children by poisoning them, after which she committed suicide, also apparently motivated by extreme poverty. And four, that so far, for the current financial year, only 26 household food gardens have been funded by the government. Five, that since the 2019-20 financial year, only 105 food gardens are still operational. And six, that only 376 food parcels have been delivered in this current financial year with a budget of 5 million rand, which were cut and slashed down to six, uh, uh, from 6 million to 5 million in the previous financial year. That we therefore resolve, one, that the Department of Local Government and Traditional Affairs identify available land at community centers and schools for the establishment of food gardens. Two, that the Department of Social Development promotes food gardens to enhance household food security and well-being. Three, that the Department of Social Development develops a targeted plan for critical social relief distress interventions in every district. And four, that the Eastern Cape Premier, on behalf of the province, lobbies the national government to peg the child grant to food poverty line. Five, that the Eastern Cape Premier, on behalf of the province, lobbies the national government to ensure coverage for child grant 
beginning from pregnancy, and six, that the Eastern Cape Premier, on behalf of the province, lobbies the national government to cut taxes and levies on fuel to reduce the cost of transporting food. Seven, that the Eastern Cape Premier, on behalf of this province, lobbies the national government to scrap VAT on food items, mostly and commonly purchased by the poorest households by reviewing the expansion of the zero-rated food basket. And eight, that the national government engage in order to review and reduce the import tariffs on foods consumed by low-income households. And lastly, nine, that pri private titles be provided to all land reform beneficiaries to increase food supply and security while reducing prices. I so move. Thank you, honorable member. Your motion is uh, noted, and it will then de be debated at a later stage in accordance uh, with Rule 133, subsection 1. Honorable Mbonyana. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Good afternoon, Honorable Members. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I move a motion with notice in terms of Rule 130 of the standing rules of the East NK Provincial Legislature that we note the following. One, in 2017, Honorable Members, during an investigation into the state of mental health in the country, the HRC found, amongst others, that mental health infrastructure in the province has been historically neglected and thus insufficient. That people with mental illness and mental disability encountering human rights violation and meeting their basic needs is a reality to be found in every corner of the globe. The preamble to the Constitution of South Africa assures honorable members equal treatment and equal of opportunity and status to all citizens. This is further echoed in Section 9 of the Constitution, which does not only protect the right to equality, but further prohibits any form of discrimination. Section 10 of the Constitution protects the rights, the right to inherent dignity and to have dignity respected. This is in line with the national and international legal obligation of the Republic. Section 12 in the Bill of Rights captures this right in the following terms. Everyone has the right to freedom and security of the person, which includes the right to be free from all forms of violence from either public or private sources, not to be treated or punished in a cruel, inhumane, or degrading way. Every person with a mental illness has the same basic rights as every other person. The rights recognized in the Declaration of the Rights of Disabled Person, that the discrimination on the basis of mental illness is not permitted and that people being treated for a mental illness must be accorded the right to recognition as a person before the law in accordance with the Constitution. Despite adequate legislation, honorable members, we often come across hinderous stories about the way people with mental illness are treated in the community and various psychiatric institutions. Further, the World Health Organization states that we are facing a global human rights emergency in mental health, as many countries less lack the basic legal framework to protect those with a disability. Therefore, Honorable Deputy Speaker and Honorable Members, I move that the House resolves the suffering and difficult conditions that some people with mental illnesses in the province find themselves in. That will resolve the slow or no progress on access to mental health care centers. As a result, they are all over the streets. The institutions regarding people living with mental illness are accessible in the Eastern Cape province. This will ensure honorable members that they receive equal treatment without delay and unreasonable bureaucratic processes. The lack of oversight by the relevant provincial authorities to ensure that the rights of persons with mental illness are respected, promoted, protected, and fulfilled in line with Section 7 of the Constitution. I so move, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. I put the motion, Honorable Members. Agreed. Honorable Gaia. Okay. 
Is she on the line? Honorable mm. members, am I audible? She's very Can I continue? Honorable Gaia? Yes, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much. Honorable members, I think let's progress. Uh, let's get now into members' statements. She is speaking from where? I'm informed that uh, she is speaking, but uh, there is no connection inside here. So should I continue, Deputy Speaker? Technical team. We can't even see her. And I requested um, that uh, this be tested before the session. But if we, uh, we are unable to connect with her, then let's progress because uh, we said we must arrange a person inside. I will request the chief whip uh, of the majority party to take over. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Speaker. I think we... <laughs> it's a test. Thank you so much. I think let me just rush so that when the echo comes, I'm done. Thank you very much. Best wishes to the Springboks uh, for success in the 2023 Rugby World Cup. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I move without notice in terms of Rule 130 that the House acknowledges that the Springbok Rugby team is currently participating in the 10th Men's Rugby World Cup in France. A Thank tournament so that commenced on September 8th and will conclude on the 28th of October 2023. Remember that the Springboks are competing in this prestigious event as the defending champions, having triumphed, triumphed over England in the 2019 Rugby World Cup final. Recalls that in their preparations for the 2023 International Rugby World Cup, the reigning world champs, champions played six matches with resounding victories, showcasing their readiness for the tournament. Recognizes that the Springboks initiated their campaign with a noteworthy 18-3 victory against Scotland in September 10th in Marseille. Calls upon all South Africans to unite in support of our champions, offering them the morale boosting encouragement they rightfully deserve extends our heartfelt best wishes to the Springboks as they strive for success in the Rugby World Cup. I so move. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chief Whip. I put the motion out of members. Thank you very much. We are now uh, inviting member statement. Honorable Kasim. Oh, yes. Sorry, sorry, Honorable Member. I see Honorable Makashala on uh, notices of motion. I think you are the last. Yes. Then I will then uh, adhere to the directive. Thank you, Thank Deputy you Speaker. I put the motion out of members. Strengthening the much. fight against organized crime. We are now uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, I move a notice of motion in terms of Rule 131 yes. sorry, that sorry, the House observes that the Freedom Charter envisions a society that lives in peace, yes. security, and comfort. Acknowledges that organized crime is an antithesis to this vision. Further acknowledges that organized crime is putting a stranglehold on economic growth and development of the province and the country. Note that organized crime has manifested itself in the form of extortions, cash in transit heists, random mass killings, and general economic sabotage. Also note that there can be no social coercion and economic development in an unstable and crime-ridden society, therefore resolved. Appeal to ordinary citizens to forward any information that may lead to the arrest and persecution of these culprits to, rele to relevant authorities. Call on state security agencies to be proactive in this fight against organized crime through strengthening the intelligence arm of law enforcement. 
to urge provincial government to strengthen the provincial safety strategy in dealing with safety. This strategy must encompass an integrated multi-sectoral approach to crime prevention. These six pillars are as follows. Effective criminal justice system, early intervention uh, to prevent crime and violence and promote safety, victim support, effective and integrated service delivery, safety through environmental design, active public and community participation. I so move to this. Thank you very much, Honorable Chief Whip. Uh, this being the notice of motion, uh, your motion then will be debated at the later stage in accordance with Rule 133, subsection 1. Now we are entering member statements. Honorable Kasim. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Honorable Deputy Speaker, business owners across the Eastern Cape are subject to extortion syndicates who kidnap them or their families if they fail to pay exorbitant extortion fees. Families are thereafter subjected to ransom demands with the threat of maimings and killings should these demands not be met. Honorable Deputy Speaker, no community should have to live and trade with a gun to its head. Indeed, the Eastern Cape economy will continue to suffer should this state of lawlessness continue. Over the last three months alone, over 184 cases of extortion and kidnapping, kidnappings were reported in the Border Kai region alone. On the 29th of August, hundreds of residents marched to the Premier and handed over a petition which included all of these case numbers, asking for responses on what action has been taken on each, amongst other demands. Today marks 43 days since the petition was received by the Premier and uh, no response has been given as of yet. In written responses from Community Safety MEC Polile Nata to my colleague Bobby Stevenson, Ms. Ignata claims that the provincial commissioner did not receive the petition and uses this as a basis to then go on and avoid answering questions pertaining to, for example, who at a provincial level is taking charge of this matter, are there any updates on the cases cited in the petition, and what progress has been made on the issues that has been highlighted. Honorable Deputy Speaker, this contradicts the feedback given to the community leaders from the Premier's office that the petition has been referred to MEC Ngata and his office. Furthermore, MEC Ngata and the Provincial Commissioner Nomteteleli Mene confirmed their attendance for the safety seminar hosted by the same community on the 9th of September. You can imagine my surprise when I arrived at the seminar also as an invited guest and was told that both of them had pulled out at the very last minute. To the Acting Honorable Premier, in this context, one can understand the anxiety experienced by this besieged community as to whether there exists any political will from the province to deal with this crisis. Unless there is political will to, de to deal with the scourge, our communities will continue to be at the mercy of these criminals. To the Acting Honorable Premier, we would like Honorable Deputy Speaker for clarification as to what happened to the petition that was handed over to the Premier on the 29th of August. When can the community expect detailed feedback on the issues raised and the cases that have been cited? And what is being done by the Premier and by the MEC for Community Safety to deal with this crisis that continues to threaten the lives of our people and the economy of our province. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Thank Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Chief Whip. Thanks, uh, Deputy Speaker. Honorable Deputy Speaker, it is with immense uh, pleasure to note the recent news regarding the Goha Dam, which is now at 100% capacity. This will bring relief for citrus farmers in the Gamtus Valley, since they will benefit from the easing of water use restrictions by the Department of Water and Sanitation. The Goha Dam, a vital water source in the western region of the Eastern Cape, plays an indispensable role in supporting our agricultural activities, particularly our citrus industry, which is the second largest exporter of citrus in the world. This industry is a cornerstone of our local economy, providing jobs and contributing significantly to our national export market. The past years have been marked by droughts and water shortages, placing undue stress on our citrus farmers 
and posing a severe threat to their livelihoods. However, I stand before this august assembly today with a message of hope and optimism. The recent filling of the Koha Dam to its maximum capacity is nothing short of a blessing for our farmers. It signifies the end of a prolonged period of uncertainty and water scarcity and heralds a brighter future for our agricultural sector. The relief that this news brings extends beyond the economic benefits. It offers peace of mind to the farming families who have faced sleepless nights worrying about their crops and the future of their businesses. It rejuvenates the spirit of our community, instilling a sense of resilience and determination to overcome adversity. Honorable Deputy Speaker, whilst we sigh with relief, let us also remember the importance of responsible water use and the need to safeguard our precious water resources for future generations. The lessons learned during the years of drought should serve as a reminder of the fragility of our environment and the necessity of sound water management practices. Further implore our government for the sterling work it has been doing in supporting the subsistence and commercial farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Chief Whip. Honorable Premier, these are the only two statements uh, that members uh, afforded us an opportunity for you to respond with the executive. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Speaker, and greetings to all the members in the meeting. I think for the first one, the petition, yes, was received by the Office of the Premier and is being processed in line with the petition's policy and the procedures. The petitioners have been updated directly, uh, Honorable Kasim, about the progress in attending their concerns. But I would also want to take Honorable Ngata to take perhaps this house through on the progress that subs under the, 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 the provincial commissioner have made an effort in the continued investment by the National Department of Police into the province, capacitating our police stations, the issues of BT, so that we avoid the narrative as if nothing is being done, because as we admit that crime continues to be a sore point in our province, there is good progress that is slowly being done. We're not where we want to be, and I would want him to, 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 to speak on that. And then I would also want to give to uh, Honorable Williams to speak on the, on the statement by the Honorable Chief Whip. Thank you. Thank you very much. In that order, Honorable Members. Yeah, thank you, uh, Honorable uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. Greetings to you to the Honorable Acting Premier, Honorable MECs, Honorable Members and Distinguished Guests, uh, good afternoon. Um, Honorable uh, Speaker, let me, um, you know, add my voice to, 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 to indicate that uh, the issue of uh, the state of crime uh, in the province and in the country is of great concern. And uh, it is not a matter for politicking. And uh, I can say as I stand here that as far back as in August, the, I mean July the 28th, I received an invitation from a group that works with foreign, uh, 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 the foreign nationals uh, from Nadine. And uh, immediately on the 3rd of August, I convened that meeting. And uh, we are working with them together with the head of the Hawks in the province, General Nguanya, the provincial commissioner, we have set up a special task team dedicated to look at the whole issue of kidnappings and extortions. Can I invite Honorable Kasim to be honorable? Because he goes to the Delhi Dispatch, he says that myself and the Provincial Commissioner and General Nguanya, we did not pitch up. He did not act honorable by verifying that the fact that we did not confirm our attendance. And secondly, it's a matter that we are attending. It's completely not true that we did not pitch up. And the Department of Community Safety was represented, and I did con indicate to the organizers that I'll be sending a rep in the meeting. He rest with the Dell Dispatch, we did not pitch up. He did not act honorable and check with me as a member of this August House. Hence, I'm, 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 I'm really concluding that uh, they are using the matter as a matter of politicking, and yet it's a, it's a very serious situation 
And it's, it's, a, it's quite complex the way he sees it. Because some of the issues through the work done by the intelligence are as a result of the weaknesses within the group of foreign nationals, where there is inside job in some instances. The demand for a ransom of 200,000 would be equal as the money that uh, the, the uh, Honorable Konziwe is keeping in his house because he's not obliging, uh, obeying the rules of the Republic by ensuring that they are banking. That is why we're saying to foreign national, please obey the rules of the Republic. You must ensure that you open bank accounts and keep the money in the banks. And, uh, uh, and again, we are following up on these issues because some are refusing to give statements, equally afraid. So that is why we are up in the game in terms of uh, you know, our intelligence capacity and uh, working in collaboration with them to ensure their safety. Nobody is relaxing on the matter. We are taking steps. We want cooperation, even of the foreign national of themselves, to cooperate by obey, or, or, uh, obeying the rules of the republic, pay tax, bank those who don't bank, cooperate and come forward and be able to be available to be witnesses where there are cases. And uh, we've got a follow-up meeting with Nadine and the general of the Hawks to give a blow-by-blow -blow update on each case. So that, that's work in progress. So they must not hijack the process that are underway and pretend as if they are the first one to raise it and there is nothing being done. It's sheer politicking. Thank you, Honorable MSC. Honorable MSC, Cocter. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Acting Speaker, uh, the Acting Premier and members of the Executive, uh, Honorable members of this House, uh, all the distinguished guests and uh, uh, leaders of um, the officials of our government. Um, indeed, uh, Honorable Acting Speaker, I would really agree with the Chief Whip of the Majority Party, the ANC, about the blessings uh, we've had around uh, the Western Catchment area. In a matter of uh, a weekend, uh, four of our dams were full to capacity in that catchment for the first time, Honorable Acting Speaker, in eight years. Mm. Um, <laughs> not only Kouha is 100%, Churchill is 100%, Luri is 100%, Hrundal is 100%. Only one uh, dam. Honorable Acting Speaker, we are holding our thumbs in Bofu, but we are getting good flows from other dams towards Impofu. The only challenge in Nelson Mandela uh, Metro uh, Municipality is that, Honorable Acting Speaker, the loss of water, the loss of water in Nelson Mandela surpasses the national country average and the international average. Mm -hmm. And what we are trying to work on, Honorable Speaker, is to work on the water leaks. And we have agreed with the Department of Water Affairs that we have to dedicate a program in the next few months to focus on the water leaks in Nelson Mandela because the collection that we have achieved now will be lost and I must report that Impofu, from where it was uh, at about 10%, it's now 28%. That's the last dam. And if that one gets full, then we are home and dry. Nelson Mandela will be free again mm. out of drought. Thank you very much, Honorable Thank you Acting very much. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Acting Premier, and the Honorable MECs and members uh, for raising these important member statements. Thanks to you as well. We are now going straight to the question paper, questions for oral reply. We are going to dedicate one hour strictly. Um, it will only be extended by the discretion of the speaker in terms of Rule 186, Subsection 3, if there will be a need for that. 
but I just appeal to honorable MECs uh, to just be succinct uh, in answering the questions because of the lengthiness of the program. The first question, honorable members, is from honorable Banga to honorable Premier. Honorable Premier? Oh, sorry, let me indicate that uh, Honorable Von Brockenroda is uh, representing Oral Bank. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The answer to the first question of Honorable Banga. Well, there are no regulations or policy at a national level that deal specifically with preferential procurement for youth, but the application of preference during procurement is undertaken through the preferential procurement regulation of 2022. Currently, the application preference during procurement is undertaken through the preferential procurement regulation of 2022, whereby it is expected of accounting officers or authorities to determine specific goals for procurement within their respective institutions for which bidders will be allocated preference points. Circular 16 were issued to the departments of public entities to provide guidance on the implementation of the PPR of 2022. Departments and public entities were sensitized to take into consideration the objectives of the RDP, the Eastern Cape Vision 2030, the Provincial Development Plan, the Local Economic Development Procurement Framework, etc. The Eastern Cape Provincial targets are being highlighted at 60% for Eastern Cape based suppliers, 40% for women and owned suppliers. 7% for suppliers owned by persons with disabilities, and 30% for youth-owned suppliers. These regulations provide provisions for organs of state to opt for the advancement of certain designated groups during procurement, and youth is included amongst these designated groups. These, pro these requirements, amongst others, were also communicated in the PPR of 2022 rollout workshops, SCM forums, CFO forums, sub-CPCs, CPCs, and XCOM. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Premier. Thank you very much. The member is satisfied. Question number two from Honorable R.S. Stevenson to Honorable Premier, represented by Honorable Notson. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The Premier signs performance agreements with MECs annually. These performance agreements are based on the government's annual program of action, as well as the commitments announced by the Premier through the State of the Province Address. A half year one on one reviews are held to discuss progress and challenges in between the Premier and these do meet, um, and the Premier meets the MECs on the needs basis. For B, C response above. Question two, if, if I may go. Notwithstanding the challenges that the Premier discusses with MECs from time to time, the Premier is satisfied with the performance of the MECs. As mentioned above, besides the generic areas of leadership and governance, KPIs of MECs performance agreements are drawn from the deliverables of POA and SOPAM that are relevant to the particular portfolio. The MECs have conducted performance assessments of the HODs. The last assessments were conducted for 22-23 financial year. The performance assessments are conducted every third quarter after the financial year. All, number four, all HOD performances have been satisfactory as per the performance assessments. Number five, no MECs have failed to meet the satisfactory performance. BB, no HOD has failed to meet uh, the satisfactory performance. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much. Honorable Member, any follow-up? Yes, there is a follow-up, Honorable Premier. Yeah. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Just one follow-up on behalf of uh, Honorable Stevenson with regards to the response number four. Um, if the, the Premier is satisfied with the performance of all the HODs, um, as stated uh, in the response, um, could the, the Premier or Acting Premier please just um, give a reason for why several of the HODs were then moved to OTP? Thanks, uh, Honourable Deputy Speaker. Honourable Premier? Though I suspect the question is a new question, but as the Premier had outlined when he announced the crack team, the whole reallocation of the HODs of government was to infer, in, enforce and reinforce the efficient, efficiency of government, notwithstanding the performance of the departments, the HODs, and the MECs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Kasim, question number three to Honorable Premier. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. 
um, question A, number one, there are 35 claims from the Department of Health that are under investigation by SIU. B, there are medical legal claims. C, at a value of 720 million. Um, A, number, number two, A, four contracts from the Department of Education, um, one, and human settlements, three. These are being processed, and C, two contracts from the Department of Human Settlements and three from the Eastern Cape Department of Health. Question three, a number of matters are still in, the, in process in respect of the above-mentioned contracts. I think that's all. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Kassin, any follow-up? Yes, uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Um, perhaps I, I should be a bit more specific as a follow-up on this. Where there are officials that are implicated and they, and they have um, by the SIU investigations and they are in sensitive positions like in supply chain procurement, are they still allowed to continue uh, um, playing a role in, in those positions um, or whilst you know, this, their disciplinary processes are, are, are proceeding or are they removed from having any uh, uh, influence over procurement uh, processes within the relevant departments? Honourable Premier. Okay, as a general principle, Honourable um, Deputy Speaker, where the official has um, cloud sitting over them and they are considered to, would have, to have an, an, an impact or influence on those processes, they are either would be suspended or would be moved to a different, um, to a different category. Thank you. To a different position within the department. Thank you. The fourth question is from Honourable Kasim to Honourable Premier. Question number four. Uh, number one, the OTP is not aware of any public servants implicated in the SIU investigation that have since resigned. Financial disclosures framework requires public servants to disclose financial interests periodically, and these are verified against existing databases. Public servants are made to account where they are pointers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Honorable Kassin, he is satisfied. Question number five, from Honorable Mkhaka to Honorable Premier. Question number five. <laughs> but he is in the house, maybe. Uh, but the question of. Mm. The answer to question, uh, question one of number five in the question paper the municipalities are responsible for rural access roads, and almost 90% are local access roads connecting villages and not leading to tourism centers. However, the district to rural roads and the Department of Transport are mainly district and regional collector roads leading to tourism centers. It is worth noting that the Eastern Cape Department of Transport is responsible for signage and fencing on provincial roads. However, due to vandalism and theft, it has not invested much on these items. Furthermore, the Eastern Cape Tourism Master Plan 2032 acknowledges the lack of rural infrastructure as a restraint to tourism growth. Many roads in the province have become increasingly dangerous and, and feedback from unsatisfied tourists and product owners emphasizes the dire need for action. Signage plays a critical role in terms of attracting visitors, providing directions and educating. The province, however, is battling a signage backlog. This impacts the visibility, awareness, and marketing of tourism products. The lack of signage makes the destination less accessible to tourists, thus eliminating the benefits that could have been derived from self-driving tourists making impromptu visits to attractions. Safety plays a very important role in the visitor's experience in the establishment of a destination's image. Should a destination be branded as unsafe due to high levels of crime, tourism will certainly be affect negatively affected. Tourists, safety, and security should be a top priority for destination managers. Number two, for the current financial year, Eastern Cape Department of Transport has set aside a budget of 11 million towards maintenance roads, signage on provincial roads. Implementation is underway in all districts with the expenditure of 3,411,520.71 cents to date. Most municipalities prioritize their budget towards the mandate that um, of the construction and maintenance of access roads and where there's a tourism center in the vicinity, such a road is prioritized and in some cases the municipalities enters into a several level agreement with the Department of Transport to maintain the roads. Thank you very much. Honorable Thank you speaker. very much. No follow up uh, will be afforded to the Honorable Member. Let's go to question number six. From Honorable Mkhaka again to you, Honorable Premier. Mm. 
mic is off. Three. There's been increased access to productive land for emerging farmers since the introduction of the land reform product programs. Emerging farmers and mostly all previously disadvantaged groups have rights to land. Disadvantages farmers have take, taken over the farms often lack access to working capital. Farms that are mainly available in the market are of poor condition and often require large sums of money to be revitalized and put back into their farmable statuses. Entry barriers into formal markets result into the demise of emerging farmers as they become price takers and lack bargaining power. High input costs whose prices are determined and controlled by a few private manufacturers increase the burden to emerging farmers who have to compete with commercial farmers to access these resources. Number two, the, um, the DALRRD has been implementing stimulus packages um, to land reform beneficiaries as post-settlement support program. The land bank's plan and finance model is aimed at improving access to finance by emerging farmers. The PACE special program is another vehicle through which access to production inputs for emerging farmers is being pursued. Preferential procurement that government is advocating should be the order of the day so that farmers can have access to markets for their products. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Mkhaka, are you satisfied? Thank you very much. And the next question is uh, question number seven from Honorable Stevenson to Honorable MEC. Thank you very much, Honorable Premier, to MEC responsible for community safety. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, I was almost not ready. The Honorable uh, uh, Speaker, the, the breakdown is provided uh, uh, into the response uh, to the member in terms of uh, the, 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 the statistics as it relates to uh, rape, categories rape, assault, mugging, and all uh, other categories. I want to uh, read uh, the list uh, that it will be forwarded to the Honorable Member. That's the first one. Thank you very much. Can I get a follow-up and uh, whether a response has been received? Thank you very much. The Member is satisfied, Honorable MEC. From uh, Honorable Camelio Benjamin to Honorable MEC responsible for community safety, question number eight. Uh, the Eastern Cape, thanks, uh, Honorable Speaker. Uh, the Eastern Cape Province has uh, 199 police stations, 150 police stations have victim friendly facilities, and the remaining 49 stations are utilizing the alternative rooms to offer victim friendly services. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Acting Speaker. I think number eight was missed uh, because that's the question to number nine. Thank you very much. Oh, Honorable MSC, you've addressed question number nine instead of question number eight, which is about drug master plan, I think. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, a a multidisciplinary operation such as uh, uh, Operation Sescona are ongoing throughout the province involving stakeholders such as Department of Home Affairs, Wildlife, uh, DERCO, SANDF, and other role players. The cross-border operations are conducted weekly to curb stock theft, illegal immigration, transportation of counterfeit goods, uh, i.e. cigarettes, clothes, and vehicle theft. And the Eastern Cape Province has developed a provincial rural safety plan, 2023-2024, uh, which has been aligned with the National Rural Strategy, Safety Strategy. These rural uh, uh, urban uh, mixed stations also conduct joint programs and operations in cooperation uh, with all role players and um, uh, to address uh, 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 the contributing factors, uh, including the, that influence crime in general. The impact that has been yielded by the above mentioned initiatives, collaborating with both the sector departments and the private sector, uh, has addressed 
addresses safety in rural communities, including farming communities. As a result, uh, crime in some other areas is decreasing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable MC. Honorable Benjamin. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, let's go to question number 10. Are you satisfied also with the response of question number nine? Thank you very much. Uh, from Dr. V. Nutsi to MSC responsible for COCTA. Thank you very much, Honorable Acting Speaker. Um, the question is quite loaded, Honorable Speaker, mm -hmm. with a lot of budgetary um, tabulations on the state of roads in Beas uh, Nodie, Inoba, Inokum Kijima, and Makana municipalities. And in terms of our response, Honorable Speaker, we have tabulated the budgets and everything relating to how municipalities have budgeted for roads and the state of roads per municipality. Um, if I would have to read all of them, it may take some time, uh, but the state of roads is bad in short, Honorable Speaker. If you look at uh, Beas Nodia, they have aggregated their roads in terms of paved roads, gravel, and so on, and tarred roads, and they have given the requested data uh, as, 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 as uh, requested by the Honorable uh, Member. Um, same uh, Honorable Speaker with Ngubaya Temba, uh, the gravel road network is constituted of only 3.4% roads which are in good condition and 76.8% the condition is fair and 19.8% the condition is bad. Uh, in Ogum the state of roads generally is poor in Inokum Kijima. Uh, Makana, uh, the roads that have been surfaced have overrun their lifespan and they are generally in bad condition. Uh, however, they've budgeted then to say how they, they will work from uh, this uh, financial year. The budgetary implications are here. Same with Dr. Bayer's not here. Although some of these municipalities, Honorable Speaker, if you look at them, those, these are distressed municipalities that I was talking about yesterday. So this is where we're focusing on to give support to ensure that services are brought to those communities. Uh, we know the challenges that they are facing and we're working hard to try and uh, ameliorate a situation where the communities in those uh, municipalities would suffer because of internal weaknesses of the municipalities. Everything is here unless yes. the member has further questions. Uh, uh. Thank you very much, Honorable MC. Any follow up, Honorable Doc? Uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. I have received the, the response and it is quite long, so um, I'm fine with the response that I did receive. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you very much. Uh, question number 11 from uh, Honorable Nutsi to Honorable Kokta. Let me see. Switch on your mic. Thank you, Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker. On alternative energy and the planning from municipalities, beginning with uh, Dr. Beas Nodia, Honorable Speaker. For now, Beas Nodia has no alternative energy to support their water infrastructure and their municipal operations in general. And Ingoba Yetemba is, is currently um, preparing to join other municipalities 
uh, in reduction of uh, electricity consumption and the, the, the toxic environmental emissions and they have in, in engaged an investor uh, to build a solar farm in Middleburg. And the district municipality has engaged also uh, the German investor for a sunflower plant, which is gonna help with uh, renewable energies in that part uh, of the province. The municipality is also funded by the energy efficient demand side uh, management program that promotes implementation of solar street lights uh, to reduce uh, the use of electricity. And so far, uh, for phase one, the reduction has been about 90 kilowatts of electricity per day that has been reduced uh, in Ingobaya Temba. Inokim Mkijima has applied for grant funding to the Department of Minerals and Energy for funding approval under the Energy Efficiency Demand Site Management Program, which also encompasses the installation of solar geysers. The application will be approved um, when the President's budget speech next year is done. Uh, currently, the municipality is using solar energy of some, in some of the municipal buildings, and these mainly act as a backup uh, as an energy source for periods of prolonged uh, load shedding. In Makana, there's no alternative uh, energy solution, Honorable Deputy Speaker, and all municipal buildings are still using conventional electricity. Um, support we are bringing, what we are doing as COCTA, Honorable Speaker, is to ensure that municipalities put these energy, alternative energy plans in their IDPs. And we use that IDP assessment to check all the sector plans of which the alternative energy sector plan is one of them. And if the municipality has no uh, sector plan, we then uh, indicate into their rating of the IDP. Um, Same in Inogum Gijima, that's what we do. And Misa and Kokta both indicated interest in assisting Inogum Gijima uh, with electrical engineer expertise, uh, support, and compilation of an electricity master plan uh, so that that can be part of their development uh, plan in the IDP. In Makana, there's no alternative in terms of assessment of the IDP. They've not included that master plan. And once we identify that, we then work uh, towards ensuring that uh, in the review of the IDP, they include uh, that sector uh, plan. Uh, same on uh, Beas Nodia. Um, these are struggling municipalities where we're working also with ESCOM, Honorable Speaker, to try and ensure that once they sign the agreement on debt relief, they also use alternative energy to try and alleviate the financial uh, resources of those municipalities being focused in ESCOM. And so what we are working on all these uh, municipalities to support the distressed ones. And um, the Ingobaya Temba, I've already reported about it, their program of alternative energy, and um, all these alternative energy mechanisms, on our speaker, they are dependent on funding resources being available for municipalities to implement such uh, uh, plans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable MEC. Honorable Nancy, any follow-up? Thank you. The Honorable Member is satisfied. Question number 12 from Honorable Lelanga to Honorable MSC Cocta. Okay. Yes, I bet that I'm sad, eh? Um, Honorable Speaker, Buffalo City, we 
as COCTA organized two meetings with uh, Buffalo City officials and the Ratepayers Association, where a committee was established to address the billing challenges in Buffalo City, including the complaints on rates. These meetings resolved to conduct a benchmarking of rates with other metros in the country. However, Buffalo City conducted the benchmark alone without the Ratepayers Association and COCTA, which was a bit of a problem. And now, this now resulted in trust being lost by the ratepayers in our work because of uh, the municipality going it alone. Over and above, the department through the IGR platforms and public participation, we supported Buffalo City to engage with the citizens and communities, working with our CTWs and what committees and what councillors in various platforms, including mayors in Bezos. IDP rep forums and community outreach uh, programs to discuss the budgets, rates, and uh, services of the municipality. So that's it on Buffalo City, Honorable Speaker. And we know that they have been taken to court about the same issues, and we are awaiting court judgment in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable MEC. Uh, Honorable Zelanga, any follow-up? Thank you, Acting Speaker. There is no follow-up. Uh, Thank you very much. The progress. Thank you so much. Question number 13 from Honorable Zelanga to Honorable MEC Cocter. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. All our 39 municipalities in the province are being monitored and guided to comply with min minimum competency regulations for financial management. This monitoring is done by making reference to the local government regulations on the appointment and conditions of employment of municipal senior managers of 2014. These regulations provide for six core competency areas of which financial management is one. The regulations conform to the provisions of the Municipal Finance Management Act regulations of 2007. That also refer to the minimum competency areas for financial management. Some municipalities do not invite the department, but all are supposed to submit recruitment files after which the MEC will confirm if they complied or not with the appointment. We monitor all municipalities responding to their inv invitations for employment of CFOs. Some municipalities do not invite, but would uh, invite provincial treasury or SALGA. In monitoring, the department uses regulations of 2014 and MFMA regulations on the competencies of CFOs. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Honorable MSC. Any follow-up, Honorable Zelanga? Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Speaker. I'm covered. With you are satisfied. Course. Question number 14, Honorable uh, Jay Cowley to Honorable MSC responsible for economic development, environment, and tourism. Good afternoon, acting speaker and uh, members of this August House. On question 14, the response is that the construction cost was 14.2 million, and on number <coughs> two, it's 220,000 that has been spent on maintenance of the facility, no expenses in terms of the salaries that has been incurred to date. And on number three, a previous concession agreement for operating the conference facility was terminated as the conference facility was not viable without the catering and accommodation options which have subsequently been completed. So ECPTA has sent out a tender. So that is in at, 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 
a tender state. And number four, none so far, because the bid to appoint a concessionaire is at adjudication stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Nutsi, she is satisfied. We all know that Honorable Kauli is part of the NHI uh, public hearings. Question number 15 from Honorable Kauli to MSC Economic Development. On number one, the capital investment was 2.5 and the total operating cost from 2016 was 4.5 million. And on number two, the Maima winery has faced a continuous negative return on investment since its inception. So uh, in close, you will find the income statement for Maima winery spanning from 2018. And also the projected income from the vineyard when the wine processing plant is built and the vineyard have been expanded is approximately 28 million. I did not read everything, uh, uh, speaker. And on number three, the vineyard is currently operational. And number four, the, the project was initially referred to ECDC and due to the amount needed for financing the project, it was referred to IDC which is currently working on it. And number five of the question is that um, the, on the jobs that will be created, uh, it's 350 permanent, will be 100, and also temporary workers will be 250. So those are the projected jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Nutsi, she is satisfied once again. Question number 16 from Honorable MEC Ndamase to Honorable MEC Economic Development. Uh, the, the conference creates space for medium, small, micro enterprise to network, but also creates space for showcasing their investment. This is enabled by the low minimum threshold of value of the investment that can be declared, which allows for investment made by small enterprises to be recognized even if they are lower in value compared to your large foreign enterprises. At last year's conference, a small enterprise, which is based in Kuka, Mshobiso Concrete, was once a Kuka SMME development program recipient, made an investment of 9.5 million in a ready mix concrete facility. In the last provincial investment conference, 46.5 billion was committed by public and private investors. In terms of the latest status quo of those projects in summary, it is the following as a uh, uh, honorable Ndamase can also read that chair. Thanks. Thank you very much. Honorable Ndamase, he is satisfied, honorable MSC. Question number 18, we are doing well today. <laughs> honorable. Uh, 17. So, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Second question from our Ndamase. The response is that the department through its oversight structures will be monitoring the entities audit intervention plans of all uh, these entities and uh, the reports are presented to the oversight meetings between the HOD and CEOs of entities. The department is planning to be part of the entities audit steering committee to avoid getting to know of the entities audit outcomes at the last moment. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Ndamasa, satisfied. Question number 18 from Honorable Hendricks to MSc responsible for education. Uh, Ngozi, Deputy Speaker, good afternoon to you. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the department uh, is a Bendisa government pensions uh, entity. Uku Tilishana and Alum Trimbu pensions, Abasabins of Agahulumente. Sikwazile, Deputy Speaker, in the Ogba, Sibene cases as the 1278, Mzegel, Ongela Kachale COVID. Sakwazi, Ukupatala, 854 out of Oiza cases. Batum Kedim Geni, Esukapela, Yom Shambike, Unga General, we government departments, Zonke, Deputy Speaker. Because about 92 cases 
as fan bars patel was mill and a masters of the court. Then I and Obana claims the families. Okokala, Okosbini, it disputes as Bangwa, Kunga nominate were beneficiaries by public servants whilst they are still at the duty. So, it's not a crisis here, by 92. So, when the city came and the capazele, unobange elangenga, wonga pumi kwazo, ezinye zazo, apa kune litigation skuzo. E yesibi nike i case ebi buzo, apa, akini na ine nito kwenza, ne pensions, deputy speaker, the department recorded, 1,272 posts again the COVID. Sikwazila again upatala la 854 besele ngayo. But again umkrimbi umekwi letter of authority from another department. And ta si ilandele la si afumani sba zilitigations. Sizo kaila ke unetiswa kulo mtrimbi we woku 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 zinziswa kwa makai. Oko kebela kule question, um, Deputy Speaker. Sikuwa zilu disclosure ikwe i cases ezi 1,158 nge 31st March le ka 2020, 23. But again... Sikwa zupatala i 813 kuzo. That worth 71 million rent. Sibene palansi ye 554 cases. Esi estimator ku, ku 57 million. Kasi zitibani size of cases. Ngoko kshia shia na kekwe capacity as. Deputy Speaker. The last two questions. Zibu penduleka pa kula ngatiso inga pezu. Kuba bekubuz ba into ni mshambenga nguno bangela we delays. Lesson chilo into bana kune local cases, ne claims between families, kweza cases, oko kala. Oko esbi ni kube ko, ukunga biko kwe documentation sometimes, like the outstanding leave gratuity payments, as worth her in 98 million. Kenga e administration, e yonakele e yala pekai. If Neka S. E. Lungi Sayo Silisebe, as required by law, and go sit up to speak. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable MSC. Honorable uh, Hendricks. Paya Danki, Forsitter, Barnimene Forsitter. I will not graag opvolg, Forsitter. Vraag 18.1. Bier was nie geantwoord door ons MVC nie. En dan vraag 18.5. B. Mat verwijsing maak na die rente wat nie uitbetaal is vir mense wat nog wacht vir pensioene. Die vraag is ook nie geantwoord nie. Voorzitter, dis nie nie bevraag nie. Dis vraag wat nie geantwoord is nie. Baie dankie. Baie dankie, baie dankie. Honor by me. Thank you very much. Honor by me. Deputy Speaker, I am the Tselu Tolo and the Mvanga. Mshaumbi, Mshaumbi, Mandim Tsele sends another submission to him to a follow-up question uh, out of getting the transcripts. Uh, otherwise, I could not hear my apologies, Honorable Member. Uh, Honorable Henry, uh, he is fine with your suggestion. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Members. <coughs> yeah, we are going to be right. Uh, question number 19. Honorable Hendricks to Honorable MEC Education. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy Speaker. Let me uh, let me do my homework now. <laughs> uh, the the question, Deputy Speaker, is loaded into five um, 
No, all, it's, it's loaded into almost five sub-questions. An assessment of early childhood development um, facilities has been done by the department with an aim to address the existing infrastructure difficulties. An annual budget has been uh, designated specifically for early childhood development maintenance and the compiled list of beneficiaries have received the funding from the allocations that I've already talked about. The second question, the department has implemented a registration drive initiative with the objective of increasing uh, the registration rates of non-compliant centers throughout the province. The success implementation of the initiative is added by effective partnership with resource and uh, training organizations throughout the province, which supplies the department with the valuable data. The centers that do not meet the compliance standards receive assistance from the professionals in the fields of environmental health, social work, to facilitate the standardization until uh, the ICAS completed uh, the compliances. The, the third question was around the registered and non-registered um, deputy speaker. Uh, we, we, we succeeded registered uh, 3,431. We have got unregistered uh, currently of 1,972. Uh, there is an attachment to that effect, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank you so much. Honorable MEC, I realize that you have addressed uh, Honorable uh, Pillay's question which is not a problem because he is present. May I just get a sense of member whether you are fine with the response? I'm very satisfied. Then you are. Thank you. <laughs> yes. The, now I will request you, MEC, to address question number 19. You were already in 20. Question number 19 is from Honorable Hendricks, uh, directed to you. Oh, no, my apologies. My apologies, uh, Deputy Speaker. The overall uh, net vacancy at the end of September 2023 was 12% um, of the declared post, uh, the post basket that we declare at the beginning of the year. The honorable uh, member from the House would understand that at the beginning of the year we have declared 52,817 posts. And therefore, out of that, we managed to populate and fill 51,991 posts. And the net vacancy, therefore, that was left was, 5, was, 500, was 509. The second question, the department issued uh, the promotional bulletins to reduce the number of vacancies uh, in, the, in the department. For example, volume one of uh, 2023, volume two of 2023, volume three of 2023, uh, so that we can, we can match uh, the, the moving target of, of, of vacancy rate. The last question, uh, honorable speaker, was the vacancy was the vacancy rate in our schools currently is below 10% now um, after, after, after we have uh, declared uh, the walk-ins as to close to wrap up quarter. So we don't have that much uh, impact in terms of the question that was asked uh, in terms of the, of the impact uh, of the vacancies. The departments achieved 1,200 and 48 filled vacancies. I'm sorry, the department before it was having 1,248 vacancies, but filled 1,140 uh, in terms of the post of educators currently as per the, the date that I've just talked about, Chair. And we filled them through the bulletins and the walk-ins as, as a mechanism to, to mitigate in terms of the 
vacancy rate that we had during the beginning of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you very speak. much, uh, Honorable MEC. Honorable Hendricks? He's satisfied, Honorable Member. We go to question number 21 now uh, from KP Anel Kumar to MEC Education. Once more, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. The pilot program started in 2017 at a national level, of course. Uh, in April 2023, the DPE established a thinking tank forum to look into the various aspects of the models of the three-streamed model that the question was referring to, referring us to. These aspects included uh, amongst the following the resourcing and funding of the model itself, the norms and standards, the PPN infrastructure weighing of and, and funding of those, um, of, those, of those norms, the demand and supply of the human capital, and also the curriculum offerings and implementation thereof, the assessment and, very, and, and, and certification. The three-streamed model, uh, Deputy Speaker, talks to the diversification of the curriculum currently that we have. And hence, um, there was a need of trying to look into whether are we able to make an impact uh, out of the certification that we're doing, the learning process that we have, the content of what is taught in the classroom, the relationship of the content with the crisis outside there so that there is an alignment of, of the throughput. Lastly, um, Honorable Deputy Speaker, all at the provincial level, the budget cuts affected uh, the implementation of this system model, however, but in 2022, the province introduced uh, and managed the implementation of agricultural studies uh, occupational studies and introduce, for example, the, tech, the math technological sciences as part of enhancement of this particular program. Currently, we have got 10 schools that are participating on the pilot in the context of the agricultural studies because our priority in terms of the provincial development plan is agriculture and oceans economy, um, Deputy Speaker but also participating schools have been able across uh, to distribute, uh, we have been able to distribute them across to the four districts in the province so that there is a fair share of, 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 of participation. We do have a detailed um, attachment to that effect, Chair. Probably let me not waste your time and, and share the information with the honorable member because it's quite a loaded question, this one. Thank you. Honorable Anil? Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Question number 22 from Honorable Vimbayo to Honorable Finance. The, uh, Honorable Acting Speaker, on question 22, municipalities have been allocated uh, 3.4 million true meek in 2022-23 and with unspent 366,882,000. And also in 2023-2024, there was an allocation. And also when it comes to disaster, to disasters, uh, assessment is conducted by the Provincial Disaster Management Center and also in the technical team where in that municipalities are expected to submit business plans for funding, and in the technical team, COCTA sits with a Municipal infra Infrastructure Support Agency, UMISA, Provincial Treasury, Department of Water and Sanitation, and then si submissions are made to the National Disaster Management Center for funding. And in 2022-2023, in 109.8 million was allocated, and municipalities are listed. And also, furthermore, in this financial year, 2023-2024, the funding of 125.9 million has been allocated in June 2023 to the following municipalities. Thanks, Chair. 
Thank you. Honorable Vimbayo, any follow-up? Satisfied. Question number 23, addressed to Honorable MSC Finance. On um, question 23, uh, in March this year, MSC of Finance tabled a revenue budget of 1.689 billion in this August House. And also there is a table here where we, we, Honorable Vimbayo will, will read and where the province collected a total revenue of 761.2 million. Uh, that is an over collection of 153 million as it was reported in this house uh, in the in year monitoring for the month ended 31 August in this financial year. Uh, as much as we are improving but also there are uh, departments that are in, underperforming, uh, like your Department of Public Works, Department of Health, Department of Transport and DDIT, and Provincial Treasury is working with those four departments to make sure that they do pull through. Uh, Honorable Acting Speaker, Somlo Mobegegle Walinf, in Ninsi Limpindulo, Apa. So Thank you very much, Honorable MSC. We go to question number 25. Oh, sorry, Honorable Vimbayo, are you fine? Thank you very much, ma'am. From Honorable Nyalambisa to Honorable MSC Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the department is still busy with the building uh, alterations that will allow suitable installation of the machine. The impact will be noted as soon as they are installed and utilized. The department has not yet finalized procurement of additional machines due to financial constraints. However, it is still in the process of pursuing uh, procuring these from Tanzania and Komani facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Nyalambisa, is satisfi she is satisfied. Thank you, Honorable Fithani. That was question number 24. Question number 25, also from Honorable Nyalambisa. The Lita College submitted two main qualifications for accreditation to the SANC, the National uh, Nursing Council and the Council of Higher Education for a three-year nursing diploma and a license by SACWA in June 2022. Um, whilst the first year higher certificate in nursing has been accredited by uh, the Nursing Council in 2021 uh, for a two-year cycle, but awaits the Council of Higher Education accreditation and registration of qualifications by SACWA. Recognizing delays by the, uh, the education, the Higher Education Council, SACWA and uh, uh, the Nursing Council granted a waiver for the higher certificate, that is two, two years, will begin from the date of the registration by SACWA. The college has also submitted the advanced diploma in midwifery uh, to the council for accreditation and also a postgraduate diploma in mental health and midwifery also in the process of development and with uh, development with a draft and implementation plan submitted uh, uh, to the council. Unfortunately, the higher education processes are cumbersome as the higher certificate uh, with the nursing council was accredited far back as 2021, but still awaits the higher education to conclude the process then uh, SACWA. The follow-ups have been made, including interventions by Office of the MEC and the National Department uh, of Health trying to unblock processes, notwithstanding uh, all nursing colleges are still to be fully recognized so that they can be able to enjoy other benefits, including clinical grants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable uh, Nyalambisa. She is fine. Honorable Fishani, question number 26 to MEC Health. Uh, the EMS fleet 
that is on the backlog are 16 rescue vehicles, 20 response vehicles. These are vehicles that are on order awaiting delivery from the government fleet management services and a trading entity of the Department of Transport. Uh, the list in the response, uh, Honorable Speaker, is provided uh, with categories uh, of vehicles and, um, and also the vehicles that are under uh, maintenance. Uh, these vehicles, I won't read the list here. Uh, so these vehicles are, are, are different uh, merchants for various types uh, of maintenance. The department has regular engagements with GFMS on the backlog of vehicle procurement and, uh, and those under maintenance. Some of the vehicles that have been procured in the past financial year but not yet delivered are expected in the third quarter of this financial year. And the GFMS is engaging uh, the merchants to fast track the release of these vehicles. A proposal has been made to GFMS that EMS vehicles be serviced at the original equipment manufacturer's dealership and repairs scheduled maintenance is fast tracked instead of spending the average of seven days. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable, Honorable Fisane. <coughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Honorable MEC. I have not got, I have not received the responses, I must say. I have not received, uh, so the MEC on the details uh, that I, I was asking. I'm not sure if I will still get because I can't even follow up on some of these matters. Then the key question is on the bid, uh, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, uh, on the concrete plans on dealing with these issues because issues of the EMS are a big challenge in the province. So that's a key question now. So I, do, I have not, I don't have the details as the, as the MEC was speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable MEC. I was responding on the assumption that the honorable member did receive, but we'll ensure that the member received. Uh, I have the signed copy already with me here, and uh, then the additional information can be provided in line with the follow-up. But uh, we fully, I fully agree that uh, the issue of uh, MS, MS images in Dondon is, is, is a uh, cause for concern. We are attending to it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, MEC. I think uh, I too also have a copy. I don't know what might have happened uh, because it's also signed, received uh, by Hansard team also. I think uh, the service members uh, will furnish you with a copy. Uh, honorable members, uh, Honorable M.M. Tuabu to the Honorable MEC Human Settlements. Thank you very much, Deputy um, Speaker. The department has set and adopted a 2% target as prescribed nationally in the public service, not 0.7 as stated. Um, the disability equity is not 0.7, but in fact 2%. However, the current status is 0.8% against the target of 2%. The department has therefore not met the target at present. The 2% target has not been met, and the current status of 0.8 with disabilities has remained constant over the current term. The department has not been successful in attracting persons with disabilities through recruitment to achieve the 2% target. There's been a limited number of persons with disabilities who apply for posts and who met the criteria for appointment. In addition, there's a possibility that not all employees with disabilities have disclosed this since there is no presently a favorable policy framework to disclose disabilities. The department has not um, recently engaged with any stakeholder representing people with disabilities, although there have been engagements in the past. The um, EE committee has been revitalized and is in the process of taking the following steps engaging with relevant stakeholders, including organizations representing persons with disabilities, revising the EE plan in line with the National Economic Active Population Targets, revise the EE policy, align the annual recruitment plan with the EE plan by reinforcing posts for the designated groups, adopt um, the measures to accommodate persons with disabilities through reasonable accommodation in line with the national guidelines. This will encourage employees with disabilities to disclose the disability so that reasonable accommodation measures can be implemented for them. Monitoring and reporting the implementation of the disability equity initiatives to the top management. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable MEC. Any follow-up from the Honorable Member? Honorable Tuabu, are you fine? 
Thank you very much. The member is satisfied. Honourable members, we have exhausted an hour, but I will just add three minutes so that we finish with human settlements only for today. Uh, question number 29 uh, from Honourable Gaia to Honourable MEC Human Settlements. 28 from Honourable Dwabo as well, Honourable Speaker. If you oh, yes. Know. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. The summary on progress on blocked projects. The province started 22 23 financial year with 87 blocked projects in all eight regions, and these have become stalled due to different reasons. Out of the 87, um, the department managed to unblock 56 and are implementing them over the multi year. The department has appointed PSPs to assess the works that have been left at various stages of construction. The plan is by the end of the third quarter of 23-24, there will be a substantial number of completed houses on site. In respect of the 31 block projects that are still remaining, processes of unblocking these block projects are continuing and done in collaboration with the implementing agents to increase the human resource capacity. The location and the reasons for the blockage or delays of the projects. Um, OR Tambo Alfonso Krisani Amatole is mostly due to poor performance of contractors, the challenges of rural nature um, of the projects in the Nelson Mandela regions is unavailability of service sites, where in some areas the scope of the projects cannot be completed. In Sarapatman, largely it has been affected by unavailability of bulk infrastructure. In the Buffalo City is the poor performance of contractors and the unavailability of sites. Number two of the same question, the progress on the projects have been, that have been unblocked is um, reported and there is an annex to that effect. Then uh, the Housing Code of 2009 and the Housing Act defines the process that follows on the engagement of communities and stakeholders during the delivery of services. There are various formal structures in place in the regions, districts, and local municipalities and wards where all developments in the human settlements are communicated. Some of the structures are through the ward councillors, the community representative, and forums. There are social facilitation officials deployed in the various regions to gather this information. Over and above this, the departmental processes, the uh, legislative engagements with the communities and stakeholders to consider their concerns and input, which is formally presented uh, to the department for intervention, and the progress is monitored by various legislative bodies. That's the one of Honorable Dwabu, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable MEC. Honorable Dwabi is satisfied. The last question directed to Honorable MEC Human Settlements from Honorable T. Gaya. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The CIA Katala breakfast session was held on the 28th of February 2020. The pledges were made, um, and only one commitment of my Kinana holding was received for the House at the session. However, as a follow up session, stakeholders were further engaged, resulting in additional nine houses to date. Ten houses have been handed over the NHBRC, two houses, Makinana Holdings, one house, CPS Construction, one, Cheaper Holdings, three, Nabe Vest Contractors, two, CHS Contractor, one. All contractors are NHB. RC registered and all houses comply with their human settlements, norms, and quality standards. Donors, after assessing the conditions of the families, chose to provide for bigger houses, not the 40 square meter. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Missy. Any follow up, uh, Miss uh, Honorable Gaia? Honorable Gaia's rep is satisfied. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Honourable members, we have come to the end of the questions for oral reply because the hour has now been exhausted in terms of our rule and we extended some few minutes to complete the department. And uh, I wish to indicate that uh, Honourable Garde and Honourable Hendricks, uh, Tosa Africans, was real uppercut for this <laughs> afternoon. And uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, Honourable members, uh, Honourable Fisan. On what Excuse rule are you sorry, raising your uh, hand? Speaker. Uh, just, uh, I think it's a part of the order. It's a point of order. Just to say, on the issue of questions, I think next time, see uh, as calling a Then as in departments, is so amalunga be kuas Okay. I would, I would start at the back, then, yes. uh, because we normally start Gapambi. Thank you very much, Shonapo. She is just suggesting that uh, next time we must start uh, from the back to the front, because there are departments that will never uh, answer any question in the house, because we are always starting from the premier, which is quite correct. 
Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. I think that's a good suggestion. Uh, honorable members, we are now going to proceed. Um, I will, oh, thank you very much for uh, honorable MECs, honorable premier, uh, for providing adequate uh, oral replies, and uh, I'm informed that uh, the documentation responses were furnished to the members, except a uh, few glitches that we have identified, but uh, those were since also resolved and uh, there were no referred questions. Uh, we must commend you, uh, members of the executive and your PLOs, uh, to take this kind of work seriously, because that's a mechanism to account when members of the House get responses appropriately and on time. And uh, I will request the Secretary to read the first order of the day. Draft resolutions by Mr. Y. Kassim on sexual harassment in schools. Honorable Member, Honorable Kasim, please take your 10 minutes and open the debate. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker, fellow South Africans. I greet you with universal greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The motion before the House today is a straightforward one. And it is the second time, Honorable Deputy Speaker, that we bring it before the House, especially considering the rise in sexual harassment cases that has taken place at our schools across the province. I put it to the House, Honorable Deputy Speaker, that the Department of Education in our province does not have an appropriate, an appropriate provincial sexual harassment policy which is applicable to the school environment. There is a national policy However, the national policy is not specifically suited to our province and, and is not equipped to deal with the emerging threats such as cyber bullying. When previously inquiring from the department, departmental officials through you, Honorable Deputy Speaker, to the Honorable MEC, sent me a policy circulated on the 8th of September 2014. And upon closer inspection, it became clear that this policy only deals with sexual harassment that may occur amongst departmental staff in the workplace. As members of this house, we have children. Some of us, Honorable Deputy Speaker, even have grandchildren. I myself have four daughters and believe that it is necessary for our department to develop an appropriate sexual harassment policy which is suited to our province, the school environment, and contemporary challenges. Sexual abuse has become a scourge in our society. The Department of Justice and Constitutional Development noted during a presentation to the Department of Social Development in February of this year that in terms of the statistics of sexual offenses against children, during the period of April to December 2022, there were 139 registered statutory rape cases which accounted for 3.12% of all registered cases, and 71 registered statutory sexual assault cases which, which accounted for 1.59% of all registered cases. A total of 4,459 sexual cases were filed, of which 3,318, or just shy of 75%, involved rape. 493, or just above 11%, involved sexual assault against a person, and 193, or just over 3%, involved statutory rape of a minor. A further 110 cases, Honorable Deputy Speaker, involved attempted rape. According to a report received in October of 2022, over 1,000 school learners have been sexually assaulted since January of 2021, with the number of cases continuing at alarming levels through 2023. Physical, emotional, and sexual abuse against pupils in the Eastern Cape is on the rise. Our education MEC, MEC Garde, appears to agree where during a mid-year briefing he raised concerns about the abuse taking place at public schools across our province, as well as special schools. The problem, Honorable Deputy Speaker, is that the majority of abuses go unreported as victims remain trapped in fear and depression. According to the, the fourth quarter police recorded crime statistics report for 2022-2023 financial year, there were three cases of rape uh, a day at day or after care centers and 67 cases of rape at schools including primary, secondary and high schools. Victims generally fear reprisals, rep reputational damage and further abuse. The latest scourge is cyberbullying, 
where learners who have shared nude pictures of themselves to a romantic partner, partner have been blackmailed into performing sexual acts under th the threat of those pictures being broadcasted to their families and their communities. As elected representatives, we have an obligation to ensure that our learners are safe from teachers taking advantage of pupils in a toxic power dynamic and are safe from one another. This requires unique policies which will allow a safe environment to speak out, without which victims will continue to be at the mercy of perpetrators. Such policy can also direct schools to implement preventative programs such as the No Means No Worldwide program, which is currently implemented in Kenya. The No Means No uh, program was initiated in schools with results that showed a decrease of 46% in pregnancy-related dropouts. 50% of girls stopped a rapist a, a year after training and, and a 51% decrease in incidence of rape and 73% of boys intervened to prevent assault. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I tabled a motion in this House with respect to this program as far back as 2019. However, it feels as if this issue is not receiving the necessary attention. Members of this House and indeed the MEC have all voiced concern over this rise in scourge, and it would appear that we have found common ground and that this motion would be accepted as a logical next step in creating an environment where victims feel safe to report abuse. It is therefore quite simple. All this motion seeks to do is to resolve that the Department of Education in the Eastern Cape must, in consultation with GBV NGOs and stakeholders, draft an appropriate sexual, sexual harassment policy for the province that is appropriate for the school envi environment and table this draft policy in the Portfolio Committee of Education within 30 days. It will not only ensure that we have a provincial policy that will be specifically suited to our challenges, but also place our province at the forefront of finding policy solutions to the new and increasingly challenging forms of abuse experienced by our learners. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I trust that as siblings, parents, and grandparents seated in this setting, that we will proudly be able to attest to having played this critical role in making our learners safer than they were yesterday. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Kasim. I will now invite the Democratic Alliance Honorable Reporter. Nine minutes. Honorable Deputy Speaker, all protocol observed. Violence <laughs> in South African schools includes threats of violence psychological abuse, robbery, physical assaults, gang violence, corporal punishment, sexual violence, and bullying. The four most common forms of school violence in South Africa are physical violence, corporal punishment, bullying, and sexual violence. Sexual harassment and violence in schools create hostile environments and can negatively impact students' learning, mental health, and well-being. Sexual harassment is an unwelcome conduct of sexual nature and can be verbal, nonverbal, or physical, including sexual assault. In South Africa, sexual crimes and bullying are definitely on the increase. The high number of girls who suffer sexual abuse and harassment in schools in South Africa by both the teachers and classmates, as well as the high number of girls who suffer sexual violence while on, while on their way to or from school have made many headlines. Nationally, in the past three years, more than 452 cases of sexual misconduct have been reported to the South African Council for Educators. Crime statistics for 2022 indicate that 294 of the reported rapes occurred at schools. In 2021-22 financial year, the South African Council of Educators received 20 complaints from the Eastern Cape. All were for sexual misconduct by teachers on learners. These figures are alarming, and as the DA, we call on the authorities to ensure that these cases are speedily and thoroughly investigated. The above statistics must be of great concern to any parent in this legislature 
and outside of it. According to the South African Council of Educators Code of Professional Ethics and the Department's Basic Educators Employment of Educators Act, teachers are not allowed to have any, and I want to emphasize, any sexual relationship with learners. Schools are seen as children's second home because they spend most of their time there. And therefore, utmost sensitivity, safety, and security are vital. However, for some kids, it is turned into a hellhole as they are sexually abused and by the same people who are supposed to keep them safe and educate them in order for them to have a brighter future. The above happens despite the Schools Act that provides content to the state's constitutional obligation to create a safe and secure environment for learning. These increase in sexual misconduct cases quoted by my colleague Honorable Yusuf Kasim by teachers is starting to become similar to the Health Department's medico-legal claims. It's getting out of control. 346 cases of sexual misconduct by teachers in schools have cost the Department of Basic Education over the past five years more than 10 million rand through precautionary suspensions of educators. This means fewer teachers for teaching, more learners not learning, and more wasted tax money. The DA also finds it very concerning that nationally the South African Council of educators only instituted, listen to this and listen carefully, 23 disciplinary proceedings last year, a mere 12% of the reported cases of sexual misconduct. Of these 19 educators who were found guilty of sexual misconduct, only four were struck off the roll indefinitely. Honorable Deputy Speaker, school violence transforms the school environment into fear and anxiety for our learners. This hampers the educational environment and consequently prevents young people from accessing and fully benefiting from their educational opportunities. School violence can have physical, emotional, psychosocial and academic repercussions like self-low esteem, social isolation from peers and depression can result from this victimization. Sexual offenses in schools increase the risk of sexually transmitted infections including HIV unwanted pregnancies, and it is said that some teachers use the authority to coerce the pupils into having sex with them for pass marks, or for pupils to progress to the next grade. This is clear evidence that sexual violations is unusually committed by people with power against those without power to assert their power. The DA believes that all schools must actively work to break this pattern of violence through educational programs that promote a safe schools environment. Honorable Deputy Speaker, more than several pieces of legislation must be consulted to form part of any sexual harassment case in South Africa. One that stands out for me is Section 17 of the Employment Educators Act, which prohibits educators from committing sexual or any other form of harassment, which by implication prohibits them from having sexual relations with learners. But this is not adhered to. I can go on and on, quote more legislation and more legislation in this regard. But let's not instead go there. But let's instead use these relevant legislation to fight for our people's safety and security. Let's not just talk the talk, but let's walk the walk and keep these teachers accountable. Let's take hands, teachers, parents, and learners, let's put a stop to sexual harassment at our schools. As parents, we want teachers to respect our children's dignity and constitutional rights. As teachers must not humiliate, physically or psychologically abuse any learner. Teachers must not have improper physical contact with our children and must promote gender equality. Teachers must not sexually harass our children in any way, shape or form. And the schools must take reasonable steps to secure the safety of our children at school. Teachers must not abuse their positions of power, but rather enhance the dignity and status of teaching profession 
and not bring the teaching profession into disrepute. In closing, Deputy Speaker, our schools must be a safe haven for our children and teachers where they can focus on academics and sports development. We need to create an open dialogue with pupils so they can speak freely about the abuse that's taking place at schools. That we can keep and hold those ones accountable that are involved in this. Safe schools will also ensure safe communities, not only now, but also in the future. Let's support this motion of Honorable Kasim as he generally seeks to fight sexual harassment at our schools at a much better tailor-made provincial size that will fit us and our province. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. I will now invite uh, Honorable Zinti from United Democratic Movement. Three minutes, Honorable Member. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Sexual harassment is not just a female issue. Both male and female students can be victims or harassers, and it can occur between students of the same or opposite sex. Sexual harassment can take and on many different forms, and it has been taking place in the schools for years, but only recently has it begun to get the attention it deserves. Some have called such attention an overreaction to normal adolescent behavior, but sexual harassment can inflict deep psychological damage on young people. Unfortunately, sexual harassment is a common problem in schools and affects the education of millions of children. According to a report called Crossing the Line, Sexual Harassment at School, students who experience sexual harassment are reported having trouble studying, do not want to go to school, and feeling sick. Honorable Speaker, children often do not share what happened to them because they fear that no one will believe them. The power between educator and student is huge and teachers are often believed over students. Honorable Speaker, Everyone has a role to play in addressing this pandemic at our schools. Parents should be encouraged to listen and believe their children if they come to them about experiencing sexual misconduct by an educator and anyone in the society. It takes courage to talk about what happened to them. The Department of Education should provide a policy on sexual harassment that will talk specifically to the school environment. The policy should provide clear guide, guidelines and support on how they should handle sexual harassment when reported to them. Department can also provide high quality, in-depth training on sexual harassment for all students and staff, including educators. The schools must always ensure that there is a child protection structure within the school premises Rodinette. that prevents such incidents. The UTM supports the motion. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much, Chef. I now, your economy. Honorable Members Order, I will now invite the African National Congress, Honorable Saziwa. 14 minutes, Honorable Member. Honorable Acting Speaker, the Chief Whip, of the majority party, honorable members of this legislature, premier and members of the executive council, heads of various departments and senior officials in all the departments and state entities. Before speaker I debate, I'd like to bring to the attention of this house that uh, our Honorable MEC is a uh, years older today. It's his birthday. Uh, happy birthday, Honorable God. Second, I would like to extend and wish for our grade 12 learners this year, and I can bet that uh, this province is going to hit the 80% uh, pass mark in this year. We also want this house to know that uh, our Springbok team has reached quarterfinals 
and in a good cause to defend the trophy. Also, our cricket team is doing well as well in the World Cup. We want this province to wish all those teams success. I don't usually praise the, 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 the obvious. Because the Paris team and the not an abandon. The middle winning like that. Nagan is swallows again, your case are chiefs. I'm not a case of chips. <laughs> One first to indicate that our support of this motion is within the context that sexual harassment is continuing, and that all of us, we must be committed to fight tooth and nail in eradication of this heinous crime against children and women who are generally regarded as weak and vulnerable in our societies. This therefore does not mean that the ANC government through various ways is not doing anything in addressing this unfortunate and stubborn misdemeanor. As I shall demonstrate below in debating the motion. And secondly, that uh, we would like to sponsor which I think Honorable Kasim is going to agree, additional proposals in terms of as the way forward, in terms of what the motion. Let me extend my greetings to all of you in this house. And I also would like to express my gratitude for the opportunity afforded by the ANC to address you today. In his opening speech in Parliament in 1994, the late president of our country, Dr. Nelson Holtada Mandela, said, and I quote, freedom cannot be achieved unless women and children have been emancipated from all forms of oppression, close quote. Since then, there's been a purposeful attempt from the government to promote gender equity by enacting, amongst others, the South African Constitution, the South African Schools Act, the Employment of Educators Act, the Employment Equity Act, and the promotion of equity and prevention of unfair discrimination act, amongst others. All these pieces of legislation were passed to ensure equity in education and equal opportunities for all learners. After almost 29 years into democracy, there are still some shocking reports indicating that sexual harassment of girls is a serious problem in many of our schools. These young girls are denied equal opportunities and effective education in schools as they are subjected to pestering by educators and boys. In addition, they are harassed by possibility, or oh, sorry, in addition, they are harassed by possibility of unwanted pregnancy and emotional pressure, and they are de de denied their self-respect. This is quite dis disturbing as the problem of sexual harassment is not limited to educators. It is also being perpetrated by learners and others within our educational institutions. For example, a disturbing incident involved a 12-year-old boy who was allegedly raped by fellow pupils at Grassy Park Primary School in the Western Cape. Additionally, a 22-year-old mentally impaired woman reportedly suffered a sexual assault by a security guard on the premises of a school in Ceres. Many attempts have been made to stop this practice of male educators indulging in sexual intercourse with schoolgirls. The National Department of Education introduced an amendment to the Employment of Educators Act No. 76 of 1998 in the Education Action Act Amendment Act of 2000, 2000, sorry. That Section 17, which is regarded as a serious case of misconduct, 
that compels all provincial demanders of education to dismiss any educator found guilty of having a sexual relationship with a learner of the school where he or she is employed. Additionally, in terms of Section 23 of the South African Council for Educators, Act Number 31 of 2000, the council may direct the chief executive officer to remove the name of the educator from the register if the educator was found guilty of a breach of the Code of Professional Ethics. Honorable Acting Speaker, human dignity is guaranteed by Section 10 of the South African Constitution to have one's inherent dignity as a human being respected and protected is another human fundamental right that underlines many, if not other, rights. The exercising of other rights comprises various manifestations of human dignity, and as such, human dignity is the cornerstone for the protection of such other rights. When another right is violated, the violation also constitutes an infringement of human dignity. On behalf of the ANC, let me remind you that educators are assigned by law with the duty of care. This means that educators must protect the learners from harm, hence the duty of care is a legal obligation. The law expects the, the educators to act as diligent paterfamilias, that is, father of the, household, of the household, at all times in education institutions. In other words, educators in terms of their duty of care have a legal obligation to protect learners from a, any form of sexual harassment and violence at schools. The ancillary government has made all these strides to make sure that our learners do not interrupt or leave schools altogether because they feel unsafe or stay at school but suffer in silence, having learned that sexual harassment and violence at schools are inescapable. inescapable. Acting Speaker, the demand of education under the insulated government in the Eastern Cape has a comprehensive policy on school safety that addresses issues such as bullying and sexual harassment within our educational institutions. This policy delineates the roles and responsibilities of all stakeholders involved. It recognizes that sexual harassment and violence have a detrimental impact on the learning environment, creating an atmosphere of fear and hostility. Such conditions should not be tolerated as part of the educational experience for our learners. To combat these issues, the department has developed and disseminated policy guidelines for the prevention and management of sexual violence and harassment in schools. These guidelines aim to assist schools and school management communities in responding effectively to cases of sexual harassment and violence against learners. Moreover, this policy outlines yes. how public Sorry, schools should... Uh, Saziwa, there is a hand. Honorable Fishlan, on what role are you raising your hand? <laughs> Moreover, this policy outlines how public schools should handle victims of sexual harassment and violence, as well as the necessary steps to address individuals who are alleged to have committed uh, so such Honorable acts. Honorable Saziwa, your time is saved. Honorable Zinti, on what role? Thank you very much, Honorable Member. That's not an order anyway. Proceed to Honorable Saziwa. That's not going to do about Kayatin. As part of this initiative, the Department of Basic Education has released a handbook for learners titled Speak Out Youth Report Sexual Har Abuse, Honorable uh, Brother, through you, Speaker. And thus, for many learners have spoken out and some perpetrators of sexual abuse, like the principal of Bondla Senior School in Tamagulu, are behind bars because of this in handbook. Honorable Speaker, the NC government is firmly committed to addressing the grave issue, issue of gender-based violence and sexual harassment crimes. In collaboration with other relevant government departments, focus on combating gender-based violence, we have designated 32 regional courts across the country. Furthermore, we have provided 3,500 family violence, child protection, and sexual, uh, sexual offenses investigating officers. 
that have received training, special training in this critical sector. In August this year, President Cyril Ramaphosa officially in, you know, inaugurated a new DNA laboratory in Quebec. This development represents a significant expansion of the policy forensic science lab, biology lab and holds great promise in expediting investigations released to sexual harassment, gender-based violence, and femicide. Honorable Speaker, this demonstrates the unwavering commitment of the ANC in combating sexual harassment and violence. The ANC supports the motion with the understanding that sexual harassment continues to persist and it is imperative that we all remain dedicated to eradicating this heinous crime, particularly against children and women who are often perceived as vulnerable within society. To bolster the support for the motion, the ANC therefore proposes amendments as follows. Can you listen carefully to you, uh, Speaker Honorable uh, Kasim? One, the Department of Education should issue quarterly reports that includes the names of all educators found guilty of committing this abhorrent crime. Two, that Section 17 of the Employment of Educators Act, as amended, should undergo further modification by eliminating that, the, the part that says educators will be found guilty if they have sexual relations with a learner of the school where he or she is employed, and say this must be totally be crept out because as long as we have that one, it allows people to exchange this act. As one would conclude that, in a sense, this clause permits educators to engage in sexual relationships with learners from the school where they are not employed at all. Lastly, that the mandatory sentence for sexual rape, remember current terms of the current criminal, criminal act, it says if you are the first time sexual rapist, you get 10 years, second, you get 15 years, third, you get 25 years. We're saying more than that, rather if you are found guilty, this case, this sentence must be increased. It may be to be having what is called, you know, a, a life sentence. Life sentence. Or capital punishment, if so. And therefore, if our colleagues agree with our amendment, we remain committed to this, and I hope they are going to accept, and we are all going to vote for this motion. Thank you so much, uh, Thank you very Speaker. Much. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Saziwa, on behalf of the African National Congress. I will now invite the MEC to conclude the debate in 10 minutes, Honorable MEC. It has been debated. And happy birthday to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, good afternoon to you, uh, good afternoon to the honorable members, uh, good afternoon to the people at the Kalari, and uh, good afternoon to the people of the province. Um, this is one of the areas that probably needed a bit of uh, elevation uh, from where I'm seated. Um, Deputy Speaker, requires a bit of an integrated effort from the affected um, government departments and also will require a, an injection of the harmonization of the policies internally in the sector and broadly within government. I will, I will, I will tell you why I am starting the discussion from that angle. <clears throat> One is that, Deputy Speaker, when you speak education generally in the country, you speak of a very highly legislated environment to a greater extent of a potential of legislations that might contradict each other, if not properly managed. But equally, as the case may be, We welcome the discussion and the motion uh, because it reinforces the commitment uh, that we have of building a stable society and a stable institutions of government. But the crisis is bigger than that. The crisis we have 
is a collapse of social infrastructure in the country. The emanation of sexual harassment in various forms, whether through institutions of learning, whether through the collapse of the family unit, whether through the gender-based violence, is a reflection of an intense engagement that is required out of the people within the house itself. For example, uh, Deputy Speaker, as I'm supporting the motion uh, and the amendment raised by, by, by Honorable Kasim and Honorable Saziwa, one day I was called by an inmate From where I am seated, I understand him to be behind bars. He called me wanting to discuss the rape case of the kid. And when I begin to inquire, how does that happen? I am seated here. I'm waiting for the date of the bail application. The individual has been given a, a, a bail a bail out of 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 the of the process. I'm 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 citing the case at Bonga Sina Secondary School. So I, I'm saying when you isolate these matters from the broad trust of governance, you are going to come back here even in the next term discuss the same issues that we are discussing now. Let me tell you what you don't want to hear. You are going to come here, and I'm citing an example. We spent time dealing with the matter of Bonga, wasted resources of government, and now we had to, we had to find a way on how to deal with the question, with the perpetrator out without being properly informed. Now, remember we have relocated the kid to another school in Mount, in, in, um, in Matatia. And the case have not been concluded yet. And I'm then saying, as we engage on these matters, probably we need to be broadly minded. What are these ticking points here? that needed to be tightened up so that tomorrow we deal with those matters and put them aside and focus on other areas um, so that we can deal with them. The time we take, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, in the LRC, uh, I can confess requires a bit of a discussion. As I was coming through that door, Deputy Speaker, no, I don't want to theorize here, I just want to be practical today. As I was coming through that door, I was entertaining a discussion of a whistleblower of Bongo Losina Secondary School. Now, because of the 90 days taken by LRC and the department in the case, those individual teachers must go back to school today. Remember, there is already signs of criminality on the case of Bongolo itself, beyond the rape that we are talking about. In particular, in terms of, in terms of the whistleblowers that made that matter to be known. So I'm then saying, colleagues, this is a sensitive matter and a matter that requires a bit of intelligence when we deal with it, but also a matter that requires a oiled government machinery that can rise to the occasion. That can rise to the occasion, Deputy Speaker. The last example that I just wanted to cite as a challenge in support of what uh, Honorable Saziwa has raised. As I'm speaking, there is a case in Aitujwa 
of a principal from a noble who raped or alleged to be raped a girlfriend's a girlfriend's kid of four years. Now, <clears throat> another problem that you are going to experience there is whether people are prepared to witness. Okay. Because remember, this happens outside of the school. Happens outside of the school. And the father of the kid is not the one that is in love with the mother now. So a bit of a complex situation with that. I'm, I'm trying to say, Che, we, we, we just needed a bit of a proper way of handling these matters uh, precisely because of what I've already raised of a collapse of a social infrastructure that is belittling the society in general. As I'm sitting down, Chair, I think the other aspect, as, just as a warning shot for the members as we go out today, let's take an example of Dolly's in a secondary school. Dolly is investigated. The interesting part, Honorable Chair, of the committee, com Honorable Sazewa, through you, Deputy Speaker, is that the, the parents there have chased out the principal. For one reason or another, amongst these issues that I'm lifting here. But they are not prepared to present as witnesses. So, in essence, it means. That's what the message is suggesting. witness. In essence, but because there is no scientific evidence to that effect. By now, you have got a school that is performing in the province that has got no principal as I'm speaking, precisely because of these shortcomings that I'm then, I'm then, I'm then suggesting, Chair. We take counsel from the discussion and we are going back, Chair, to look at how best do we elevate uh, this matter because beyond the academic progression of learners, the elephant in the room now is this, is this, is this matter in education. Whether it's an issue of a learner versus another learner, like in Atwell Madala last month, or these cases that are here. Because again in Atwell Madala, we're short circuited by the Department of Justice. We're forced to, to take that boy back to school. Because nobody wanted to, to prevail on the matter in terms of the evidence leading uh, the, 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 the subs in, in that particular matter. So I'm saying, let's join hands in dealing with this sketch and be able to, to, to deal with it and, 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 and provide leadership thank accordingly. You. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much, Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, honored members, <coughs> uh, I now going to put the draft resolution as presented by Honorable Kasim from DA, discussed and debated and amended in support by Honorable Saziwa of the African National Congress. Now I put the resolution. Agreed. Any objection? Thank you very much, Honorable Members. I will now ask the Secretary <laughs> to read the next order of the day, the second one. Draft resolution by Ms. M. von Bochenrode, Rhodes. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable von Bochenrode, 10 minutes, honorable member, to open the debate. Acting Premier, members of the executive, honorable members of the house, ladies and gentlemen in the public gallery, officials, you are all greeted today here. 
Speaker, as I'm standing here today to debate, to debate a very important motion in the month of October that is singularly put out for Transport Month. Whilst this month is said to be Transport Month, it is quite saddened to state the state of affairs of our road network within the Eastern Cape Province. Honorable Speaker, I would like to preface my motion by taking this house back to a motion that was raised by Honorable Dr. Kunbiki Knutze in this house regarding plastic roads. Honorable, Deputy, Honorable Speaker, I can vividly recall that the Honorable Members have moved this motion in May 2017 and it also debated in 2018. But sadden, this House largely reject the motion with trivial issues. I can recall the issues that was raised in this House that the road will burn, people will toy toy, how will we construct the road, it won't be friendly to the environment, and so on and so on. But Speaker, I can say today, this road do exist within the Eastern Cape boundaries, and it's called the Voltema Road within the Koga District Municipality, Koga Municipality. Today, it's proudly that this road is fully functional and that the maintenance on this road is at a very low. Honorable Speaker, Going forward, our current road network in the Eastern Cape is fast deteriorating. Unfortunately, the Department of Roads and Transport are unable to maintain and fix these roads. Honorable Speaker, my dear Honorable MEC of Roads and Transport, Omar Ngata, has openly acknowledged that we do not have the money nor resources to adequately maintain our roads and our road network in this province. It is for this reason that, I, that this motion is here before us today. Our further contributors is the heavy freight on our roads that exacerbate the dilapidation of our state roads and our road network. Honorable Speaker, the N10 is known for heavy freight trucks as well as manganese trucks. On average, there's about three serious accidents occurring on a weekly basis. During this month, the Democratic Line is calling on the MEC and its counterparts to really alleviate the heavy freight on our roads and to fully implement a fully fledged rail network within our province. In doing so, it will obviously reduce the volume of high freight trucks on our roads and will also ensure that bulk of the goods will be transported at a much faster and cheaper on rail. Honorable Speaker, we talk about innovation and we'd like to welcome the innovative idea on the 3rd of October whereby a vessel was sailed out at the East London Airport Harbour with 30,000 matrix of coal, or manganese, sorry. Speaker, Einstein said, if you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, it's called madness. It is my humble appeal to the, you, to the MEC, that the Department of Transport is not doing the same thing over and over, but expect a different result, because that, will be, that madness will be at their own peril. The old convention of constructing roads, bridges, as well as filling of potholes should come to an end in this province. We really need innovation, MEC. We need innovation in a sense of making sure that we move away from the old convention and fully implement plastic roads on our roads, as well as new and innovative technology that's available in this country. 
It is proven that plastic roads are much durable and long-lasting with low-cost maintenance. In a recent IQP that the MEC has responded, the current road projects within the province stands at 253. However, alone in, in the Sarah Bartman district alone, there's 156 of these projects. Honorable Speaker, the elephant in the room is, it's with great sadness that none of these projects will come to a completion because we do not have enough money. And unfortunately, we will see in the near future, future that some of these districts will run out of money and we'll be unable to complete projects as well as road maintenance on our roads. It's for this reason that we are saying, MEC, public-private partnership should be formed with relevant stakeholders, communities, farming organizations in order to assist government because currently the, gov the government could, cannot fulfill their mandate. In a response further received by the MEC Nata, Nata, nah. the majority of our provincial road surface is in such a bad condition that pothole repairs is no longer an option, but it has become a dangerous element. It is said that the department is now embarking on on a process to reseal and rehabilitate our roads, but this project can only be done twice a year at our current budget. It is further revealed upon the end of March 2023 that the Eastern Cape Department of Transport has paid out motorists approximately 2.8 million for damages of vehicles caused by potholes and our road condition. Honorable Speaker, this department can and must invest in new innovative ideas. They must invest in innovative ideas like the machine manufactured by JCBS, an all-in-one machine for pothole repairs. This machine has specifically been designed to repair potholes, ditches, and other road conditions within eight minutes per incident. The department could further also consider the automated patching machine that, calls, that is called the Jet Patcher, which is used in the city of Chuane in May 2022. This machine was used to fix potholes in less than 15 minutes, and it was tested and it was well received. The city of Chuane fixed over 4,000 square kilometers of potholes with this type of innovative ideas. Honorable Speaker, I'm appealing to my colleagues today that we're not playing politics today, but we put the citizens of the Eastern Cape first. I'm appealing to my colleagues that we support this motion One minute. for the sake that we thrive, we have a thriving economy, making sure that people get to work, children get to school, farmers get their produce to the markets, and our economy is thriving. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. I will now invite Democratic Alliance, uh, Dr. Nutsi, to debate the draft resolution. Nine minutes, Honourable. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker, uh, Honorable uh, Acting Premier, um, Honorable Members and uh, any guests, uh, good afternoon. Honorable Deputy Speaker, they say that history repeats itself, but I'm really hoping that history doesn't repeat itself in this house today. I remember the day very, very well. It was the 17th of May, 2017, I was sitting there in the third row, uh, round about where Honorable Zibonda is sitting now, and I tabled this motion. The motion essentially was to say, 
let's run a pilot project to replace a portion of bitumen uh, in the road construction uh, process with waste plastic. Because I've, I've seen that it, it was used in other countries um, where the temperatures are much lower, like Scotland, and, and countries where the temperatures were much higher, like Abu Dhabi, where they used this product to, to build runways uh, for aeroplanes. And I thought that with the massive uh, roads maintenance backlog that we have in the Eastern Cape, at that stage it, it was slightly over one billion rand. Um, with a high unemployment rate and with the amount of plastic, uh, waste plastic, that we as South Africa put into the ocean uh, every year, which is around about two million tons, I really thought this could be a triple win. And that this is uh, the type of project that could really address this backlog, address unemployment or a portion of it, especially for unskilled people, and could address the, the amount of waste that, that we put in our oceans every year. But on the 16th of August, the next year, 2018, we debated this motion another day that I remember extremely well. And the opposition was, was opposition to the DA was vehemently opposed to, to this idea, not just opposed, vehemently opposed. Uh, to this idea. But, Honorable Deputy Speaker, I really believed in this idea. I really believed that if we could run a pilot somewhere, and if we could get this implemented and prove that it works, we could create a demand for this uh, plastic product. And that we can uh, address a lot of opportunity for especially unskilled workers because anybody can collect plastic. And if I can just give you an idea of the amount of plastic, for only one kilometer of this road, and remember it's only a portion of the bitumen that is, uh, is replaced uh, by waste plastic, we use one and a half tons of waste plastic or 1.8 million plastic bags. Anybody can collect plastic. It changes the value chain. It gives that person, even if it's not a lot, it gives them something to put food on the table. It reduces that amount, excuse me, that amount of plastic that is going into, into the ocean. And it can really address the roads maintenance backlog. Just as an example, for 30 years, you will not need to do anything on a road that has been properly built with this additive in the bitumen mix. For 30 years, you will not fix edge breaks or potholes or cracks in this road. Can you imagine the saving that can go into new roads infrastructure if we start building that way? So what I did was, because I believed in the triple win that this, the project had to offer, I actually went to uh, the former mayor of Koga, um, which is now Honorable uh, Arosho Hendricks, now a member of this house. And I, I went to him and I said to him, please, won't you think about just, just running a pilot? I'm not asking you to, to start building with this forever. Just run a pilot. Let's just see if this really works in South Africa, if it works in our climate. Let's jump over the hurdles that this project could possibly present to us. Let's see what the difficulties are and see if we can overcome them. And he agreed. So on the 13th of December in, in 2019, I must be honest, was one of the proudest moments of my life to stand at the launch of, of this road when it was finally complete. We went through so many ups and downs it, and it was emotional at times. It was difficult at times. Some things didn't always work out the way we wanted it to, but we overcame those hurdles. And I'm so proud of that road in Voltemada Street uh, in, in Jeffreys Bay in the Koga municipality today. And I, I really, I invite uh, through you, Honorable Deputy Speaker, I will invite all the members to, to come and look at it. The proof is there. The proof is in the plastic. I, thought you, I think you were uh, thinking I was going to say the proof is in the pudding. But the proof is in the plastic. 
it is really there for anybody to see. Uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, this, the product that we used also uh, contained... Uh, sorry, there is a hand. Honorable Fishan, <coughs> your time is safe, ma'am. Yeah, may uh, I ask the member a question? Just once. Honorable member, are you prepared to take the question? I'm prepared to take yes, a, a you question. Can. On Thank you, Doc. Uh, I think it related to these plastic roads, is it not why Honorable Horatio uh, Hendricks was reshuffled by implementing <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> Honorable member? The, that was uh, devious. Devious. <laughs> Thank you. You can proceed, John. Honorable. But, uh, Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker, thinking back at, at what might have been the reason why this, this motion was not adopted by this House, I think it is human to be cynical of, of certain new ideas. I think it is, is human to be scared to try something new. But, Honorable Speaker, we have persevered. We have overcome many, many hurdles in, in terms of this, this project. So my plea today in this House is that, colleagues, let us not be afraid any longer. Let us be unafraid to pursue new frontiers. Let us be bold in adopting new innovation. Let us embrace the triple win that this project has to offer. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the next frontier is to implement this innovation hopefully by the Department of, of, of Transport as a pilot or in, in, in other municipalities across this uh, province. Honorable Deputy Speaker, all we are asking, essentially all I am asking, is that we continue to do what we have done for many, many years, which is building roads. I'm just asking that we consider running a pilot to do it in a slightly different way. Than, than what we have always done. Let's create these jobs for unskilled people. Let's clean up our environment. Let's address the massive road backlog. It can be done. So today, on the 11th of October, six years later, 2023, this is my plea uh, in this August House today. Let's run this pilot and build roads with the waste plastic component and remember those that carry the light must have the courage to, ha to go into the darkness first. Let the Eastern Cape carry that light and go into the darkness first. And to conclude, Honorable Deputy Speaker, as I always say, innovate now, ask me how. Thank you. Uh, may I invite the economic uh, freedom fighters no debate today. Uh, there is no UDM. There is no Honorable Lodag I'm seeing. Let's proceed. There is no ATM. There is no Freedom Front Plus. Let me invite the African National Congress, Honorable Mkhaka. <laughs> 14 minutes I will time and advise Honorable Member when you are left with two minutes. Deputy Speaker, Honorable Acting Premier, members of the Executive Council, members of this August House, let me take this opportunity to extend my fraternal greetings to all of you. If I had time, with that bonus phone number, speech I was going to share an experience that one time, sometime in 2012, Honorable Tringo, as chairperson of the Portfolio Committee for Public Works, took us to West Africa the Sahel region. Sahel region is constituted of Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, 
Senegal. One of the things were shown, which was surprising to all of us, was that those countries are former colonies of France. And because they, are, they belong to a Francophone category, 28 countries in the continent belong to Francophone. Um, their road networks is done through tendering system, but those tenders can only be assessed by French companies. We were taken to a big road that was under construction then, made of this plastic model. And I just want to share this in Senegal. In Senegal, made of this plastic model. Um, we explained how this plastic model is evolving. But the negative impact is that it's one model that does not have potential to generate jobs. Now, precisely because the population of, 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 of these countries mostly are utilizing paper bags, not plastics. And because of that, plastic were ordered from France to do the roads of those countries. In fact, many of, the, of those countries, they don't have surface roads to date. That's why they're experiencing a revolt there's no central bank. Their central bank is in France and whatever. I'm trying to share this experience because the African National Congress is never against innovation and creativity. Whenever. But we embark on a matter having followed procedures so that we finally engage on the matter, on the concept itself. And the honorable member is bringing this matter for the second time to this house. And I don't remember a representative of the A bringing that matter to a portfolio committee of transport where matters are engaged. And that's the shortcoming of this presentation. Because under normal circumstances, new concepts, innovations, and etc. Because portfolio committees are multi-party committees, the first step is to take that new idea to a portfolio committee through your rep so that other parties find an opportunity to engage. We never had that opportunity. I'm sitting in that portfolio committee under the leadership of Honor Rep. Malam Lela. And, 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 and because we want to create an impression that we are allergic to new ideas, you decide to be opportunistic on the matter. We never are against our new ideas um, and honorable member around this particular issue. But let me respond because this matter again as it was presented by the honorable member who was presenting the motion, talked about some matters that are still underway in the Department of Transport. Sandral, for instance, is a national agency, holds authority and custodianship over more than 5,200 kilometers of the province designated national road networks. Thus, maintaining robust intergovernmental relations with the agency is one of the critical phases. For the period spanning from 2023 to 2027, 
Sunral has been allocated a substantial infrastructure investment of 55.9 billion for national roads in the Eastern Cape. During the 2022-23 financial year, significant progress has been made with the completion of work covering 234 kilometers of the road network. An investment exceeding 3.5 billion has been directed towards special maintenance, improvement, and resealing of this network where potholes are most prevalent. There's an allocation by government to actually attend to these weaknesses of potholes, maintenance of roads around this particular matter, over and above other ideas. In the policy speech of the MEC for Transport, it was disclosed that an additional investment valued over 21.7 billion has been allocated to construction projects across various districts. The distribution of these funds is as follows. And I would like to take your time because each district has got its allocation to deal with improvements of road, maintenance of roads, and, and resealing of roads. And, 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 and if you go elsewhere in these districts, Kumutulpa, Kiasajans, Queenswindler, Z district, because each district has got its own allocation. Oh, our time was 9.5 billion, our friends of 4.4 billion, Amatole 2.1 billion. Krisani, 1.7 billion, Sarah Batman, 1.8 billion, ECM, 937 million, Nelson Mandela, 418 million. This is a clear demonstration that government is hard at work and really cares about investing in infrastructure that must improve the socio economic conditions of our people. Maybe the idea is attractive. But where we have a challenge, critically in the province, is about the generation of new work, new job, creation of jobs for our people. And if, 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 if this innovation would impact positively to such, there might be no reason for us not to consider it. To address the issue of potholes, the Minister of Transport initiated National Road, National Pothole Campaign branded as Operation Valazonge. Operation Valazonge. A call to all communities to deal with this question. Ikuha is next door. And I know that Ikuha is characterized by many potholes. It's one of the municipalities that has got challenges of potholes. And I'm not referring to a former mayor or that mayor. I'm referring to an area as I know it in town and outside town. That's what we are experiencing. And I would wish to see this model uh, of Kocha. And I can't negate that one. Uh, it's an, I said it might be attractive around this particular issue. The campaign is led by provinces and supported by Sandra promoting collaboration across three spheres of government. It involves the utilization of technology to document existing potholes allowing maintenance teams to be assigned efficiently and enabling the tracking of repairs through a user-friendly app. We've been introducing technology in identifying portholes so that we've got records as far as this particular area is concerned. Honorable Speaker, it is no secret that our roads require approximately 30.5 billion in capital investment, owing to a historical backlog resulting from racial discrimination of the apartheid regime. Roads in the country still reflect racial patterns. Roads in the country still reflect racial patterns. If we are in rural areas, we will never test it, we will never witness the surface road. If you are in black township, selectively, again, but if you are in an urban areas, a town, roads are solid. 
precisely because over and above government, a private sector's focus is to sustain those white areas, whether you like it or not. It's happening as we speak. Now, and I'm saying it has adopted a racial pattern, and if to, for you to address it, you must be that conscious, transformed individual who understands the real challenge confronting our people in this country. On our speaker today, the situation is further compounded by climate changes and global warmings. Heavy rains, storms, wind, forest fires continue to damage our road infrastructure. And I've witnessed last week that Kukui train a Tati Manganese from a northern Cape, Yaisi Sap. Two minutes. Yaisi Sap Mount, which is a new creativity, trying to relieve road infrastructure for a benefit year rail uh, in our province. It's no secret, uh, Honorable Chief Speaker, that there are still challenges that are still confronting all of us. And there's no one who can deny that across the country there are potholes. And these potholes, mainly, the situation is compounded by the new fund ch changes or climate changes that are taking place uh, uh, but again, there are new ideas during this month. Last week, Mr. Simsikal, Pandi Amano, Honorable Hendricks, our first experience. One minute. Of a new road network. 80 kilometers high bridge. Saibona Londopa, first experience. So that we don't create an impression that government is doing nothing in the province of the Eastern Cape. There is progress, there might be setbacks, but again, there is commitment from government through budget allocation to deal with these particular challenges. And therefore, this is a quotation Winston Churchill. Ka Winston Churchill. I am Pimosu Churchill, Winston Churchill. Was Winston Churchill? 20 seconds. Get closer as a Munganda. In Fazi, Banga, Fasari, Britanni, Wako, Kulimerica, Wako, Kulustali, Mosco, Eum Kalel, and Dobaz of Sasa and Wawenda, Uhita. Go to Unendo Art. Whatever happens, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is a courage to continue that counts. And that's the commitment that these honorable members are always harboring. Thank you, honorable. That honorable. commitment to continue doing our work. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I will now invite Honorable MEC, Honorable MEC Ngata, to conclude the, the debate in 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker, Acting Premier, Honorable MECs, Honorable Members of the House, Distinguished Guests, HODs, and my Acting HOD, the new one from the box. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Abambon, uh, Mrs. Matumane. Uh, now we are acting HOD. Yeah. Hey. Also, Mabaka. Honorable Speaker, we are the first one as a department to admit the challenges and the state of roads in the province. And Honorable Mkhaka, thank you uh, to you, Honorable Speaker. He has done a good job in exposing the opportunism and the half-truths that are being told by some who came to stand here in this podium. We are the ones who fully appreciate the impact of the state of roads to the economy, hence 
we deliberately decided to prioritize what we refer to as strategic roads, which include roads to farms, roads to factories, which include roads to health and education facilities. That is the work that we're doing. And uh, on the issue of alternative technology, again, we're the first ones through the former MEC. We initiated a process to investigate alternative methods of delivering roads in the province, given the escalating prices, including of uh, prices per kilometer. There is no secret even in this one which you're talking about. And fortunately, I speak because I work with engineers. I don't know those who speak up whether they are engineers. I work with engineers who went to visit this road in Koha. They came back and said, one thing is for sure. This method is no cheaper than the conventional construction. Secondly, plastic does not replace ingredients used in conventional methods. It, instead, it becomes an additional to what is already used, which means the tackling this task is not one size fits all. That is why as a department, we have looked at all alternatives, including the paving, which is taking place in some of the roads. Because the volume of cars is a determinant what type of road you should have. And the 30 years uh, without maintaining has not been tested. That road is a new road, unless you bring evidence that indeed you can stay with it for 30 years without maintaining it. There is no evidence in that direction. We have yet to see the one that uh, honorable members are talking about. It's something else not to have budgets, because the honorable member said that I said uh, there is no money. Uh, something else to say there is no money, something else to say there is no enough money, which is what is the reality. Because there can be, there can be no enough money in tackling this task. And the honorable member, as a member of the Portfolio Committee of Transport, I would have thought that he would join the Portfolio Committee in helping us as a department to secure, you know, more resources in terms of budget allocation than to stand here and pretend as if this is not our concern, is not something that we're working with, uh, we, we're working on. Just to say, honorable members, uh, we are determined, uh, hence we are introducing various methods of service delivery, including the service level agreements, with the municipalities, including the procuring of plant, so that we allocate it to re relevant municipalities that are strategic, so that this huge task of dealing with the state of roads, we can tackle it quite more, better, and effectively, taking into consideration the climate conditions. Because uh, we must be able to adapt because uh, climate change is with us. Honorable Chair, let us instead uh, work together than politicking around these matters. Let's appreciate that we have a huge task on our hands, and we as a government, we are determined working together with our people and with all South Africans to ensure that we tackle this task head on. We make all our roads a uh, Zambeg because even those that are not budgeted for, when the road is not, community is unable to access a school, we intervene because we must ensure that people are able uh, to, to, to access these important resources. And thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable MEC. That concludes the debate. Honorable members. I will now put the draft resolution to the House. I put any objection? No objection. Thank you, honorable members. I will ask the secretary to read the third order of the day. Draft, revo <laughs> draft resolution, Mr. P. Anil Kumar.
gender-based violence. Thank you very much. I now invite Honorable Anel Kumar to open the debate. Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Premier in absentia, the EXCO, Honorable Members of this August House, the people still viewing us through the social media. It is always a pleasure to greet you on behalf of African National Congress, the Congress which stood the test of time. Today, what I am presenting as a debate on gender-based against Violent, I mean, how GBV or gender-based violence can be tackled. That particular subject needs no introduction. It needs no reference. Simply because of the reason one in three people across the globe at least has been affected by this particular pandemic every day. There's a question being raised. When we talk of gender-based violence, we always talk of what is happening against the women. True, because mostly that is what is being reported. But the confirmed reports are saying that even 52% of the men also are being affected by gender-based violence. Unfortunately, some of the people are not prepared to come out in that kind of a situation. We may not have proof. But Gender-based violence is actually a global pandemic. I want to say that whenever we talk of something about Africa and something about South Africa, people started questioning about that. They will start saying that it's only happening. This is a global pandemic because I am saying that 28 European nations, according to the report, those countries under the EU, one in three women, has experienced either sexual or physical violence against them. 22% of the women in European Union in these 28 countries experienced violence from their partners. There are 11% of the women. Sexual harassment has been reported in those cases. 5% of the women in the EU was, were raped. One in two women, at least at the age of reaching 15, has been affected by violence. So I am saying that what we are discussing is not an issue of South Africa alone, North Africa alone. It's a global pandemic. Mm. It is a pandemic within a pandemic. And that is why when concluding the African National Congress Women's Section in the capital of Angola, one of the greatest sons of South Africa ever produced, our own Oliver Tambo, he said this. He said, the mobilization of women is not the task of the women alone. It is not the task alone of the men. It is the task together with the men and women. And that is why today we are debating this particular issue because sometimes we talk of gender-based violence. People get upset because we have been always talking. We put machineries, we put systems, we put strategies in place. Why still we talking? It is like, just like, you know, when you get sick, when you get a flu, sometimes you take antibiotics. And taking antibiotics many times, what happens? The body becomes immune to the antibiotic. But here it is not the question. Gender-based violence, we cannot be apologetic. Up until it is being sorted, we have to raise that. Recognition of violence against women as a human right violation forms the cornerstone on our approach. It is the approach we are making that it is a human right violation. Women of all ages continue to be subjected to many different forms of violence at the hands of men, family members, colleagues, and complete strangers employ violence to them. It is because violence against women is the result of an imbalance of power between women and men. The question will be, what about the violence against men? It also, where the imbalance of power comes into play, many factors come into play. It is not individually experienced abuse. It needs to be understood as a means of enforcing the subordination of women or men. Throughout the history, power relations between women and men have been unequal. We all know that. It has never been equal. Resulting the male dominance over the widespread 
the widespread structural discrimination against women and other people. To varying degree, patriarchal culture, sexual norms, discriminatory divisions, and labor, financial dependence, there are many factors. Also, we look at the LGBTQI community. We have been trying hard to the acceptance of the LGBTQIA plus community, but still we are not, we are failing. There are many kind of advocacies are happening. A person has been born as a person. Why don't you accept him or her as a person? But we are failing to do that. That's again, we should say that it is violence. The plan to recognize how to combat gender-based violence needs to be looked, and that's why today we are presenting this motion. This does not mean that South Africa has been sleeping, or the ruling party has been sleeping. In September 2021, the National Assembly passed three laws with the aims of improving the criminal justice system in response to the GBV, enhancing protection for survivors, that, and also strengthening the prevention strategies. In addition, President Cyril Ramaphosa then pledged $1.6 billion to fight against GBV, and to my understanding that uh, portions of that has been given. So we are here saying that state got a responsibility to respect, to protect and fulfill the human rights of all genders, all citizens. Therefore, the states must ensure that they have taken all reasonable measures to prevent, to investigate, and to punish all forms of violence against women including the family and the domestic unit. Unfortunately, we all here, many political parties are here. We do have the political will. There is no doubt about it. Unfortunately, we are not able to address the challenges related because of the insufficient funding, budgetary limitations, and lack of collaboration between stakeholders. If you look at training among the police, law enforcement, the departments, they lack some kind of issues they, they are unable to manage. Too few GBV desks has been established at police stations. We have been trying for that. It has not been happening. The Commission of Gender Equality, if you look at last year, they published a statement. They said they are facing resistance and lack of cooperation from certain departments. I think it needs to be addressed. In our own province, Premier Oskar Mabiane, I am saying this not because he is an ANC premier. He did this. He pledged several initiatives, including the establishment of a DNA lab, which happened. Improved training for healthcare and security personnel, better reporting mechanisms for individuals and people with disabilities, mentorship programs. All this has been done in this province. So what is my point here as African, as we are saying as a member of this legislature is that nothing is starting from the scratch. We need to affirm, and the days of rhetoric should be put aside and come into action. Therefore, we are resolving here, strengthen the law enforcement and judiciary to meet harsh sentences against the culprits. I was so happy to hear Honorable Saziwa was saying that it should be the life imprisonment for a person who actually intruded into the privacy of a woman. So it means that we need to have harsh sentences. But what is the stats saying? The regional courts recorded 1,821 convictions and 968 acquittals in 2021-22. It means 35 percentage of the culprits has been acquitted. And this is where we have a problem. We are setting up laws, but that laws are not getting the enough evidence to punish them. To commit the provincial government and legislature to actively campaign for the South Africa free from gender-based violations. Remember, 2006, United Nations declared that there should be a 16 days activism. And that campaign has to be taken to every corner of the country, every corner of the province, every city, every rural areas, so that people will be protected. He urge governments to ensure that the research is accessible to promote involvement. The data is very, very important. Once the data is available, we will know that how much damage it is making on the GDP of the country. So it is important. Unfortunately, 
there is high level acceptance in other words we all acceptance we all accept gbv is a problem but the problem is there is a low level of response so all of us have a responsibility to put into that there is a poor understanding of that gbv is a human right violation some areas in uh, rural areas we go a punishment which is seen as a gbv they will say no this is normal this is a normal practice we used to do it is the understanding of the gbv it means education training is needed in those areas a distinction needs to be made between pathological violence which needs the response from the mental health service and the behavioral gbv which has a potential to tackle by communities perceived as a family problem sometimes we find that there are issues being raised and people will say it's a family issue it's not a gbv it could be a family issue but the pride of a woman the pride of a daughter has been affected it means it is gbv in increase and integrate the number of shelters and support services particularly identified by gbv hotspots i can see honorable fanda your department is doing a lot of shelters as a social development mc that kind of shelters needs to come when a person is looking for a shelter it is important all stakeholders responding to gbv incidents have a duty to protect the victim from the gbv the issue here is that how much protection are you giving to the innocent person who is persecuted that persecution is not taken care because we are not giving support to reduce risk to promote resilience to aid recovery create lasting solution to the problem of gbv i am closing i am introducing this debate by one saying minute, that one minute left obama we know that barack obama said this i refuse to stop fighting now i refuse to stop fighting now for the sake of my daughters and us we must do better to make sure women are respected and treated equally i change women men lgbtq i a plus or are respected so that we will have an ideal nation we will have an ideal country thank you thank you honorable pilay honorable sbonda Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, greetings to the Acting Premier, Honorable MECs, MPLs, staff, and the members of the public. The reality is that daily, women and children are victims of domestic abuse and gender-based violence, and our systems that have been put in place to help them continue to fail. The latest stats show that sexual offenses came in at 11,616 in the, in, the, in the last quarter. In the sexual offenses category, rape did drop by a mere 2.8%, with 9,252 cases registered, down from 9,516 during the same period in 2022. Murders of children increased by 20.6%, 20, 20 with 293 children murdered up from 243 during the same period last year. That translates to 50 more children killed over a three month period. Violent crimes committed against women and children in the LGBTQIA plus community were recorded alarmingly high at unacceptable levels. 40% of rape incidents take place in the victims or, perp or perpetrators homes, meaning our homes are not safe spaces for us as women and children. It gets worse, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs. The stats reveal that the level of convictions is very low, translating to a mere 3% when compared to the number of cases opened during the same period under review. This is a bleak picture of the status quo in our country, and the Eastern Cape is no different. Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. It is quite clear that we need new strategies to overcome GBV. In 2019, the Honorable President Ramaphosa appointed a steering committee in the, in the presidency, co-chaired by government and civil society organization, 
one of the committee's purposes was to establish appropriate structures in the offices of the premiers and mayors to work with social partners to drive and coordinate efforts to end gender-based violence. But as with most of the president's promises, this was not fulfilled because I do not recall such a structure being constituted in the Eastern Cape. Four years down the line, I have not seen, I have not seen a single report produced by this structure. As a result, the fight against GPV in the province is not well coordinated. The, the police are, are blaming the NPA. The NPA is blaming the Department of Justice. It goes on and on and on. In the recent MBs are called by the Premier in M. Kagezwin, Minister Peggy Kale shifted the blame to the Department of Justice and Correctional Services and brought no new plans or interventions to solve the problems that the women in the area are facing daily. In some areas in this province, women leave their homes and move somewhere else for their safety. This cannot be normal, nor acceptable in a society where we are supposedly free. GBV is an endemic in South Africa. The speed at which government is moving when trying to fight is not satisfactory. As a result, we are losing the fight. More and more women and children are dying as a result. I previously stood on this podium and proposed that Premier Oscar Mabuyane moves quickly to establish a multi-stakeholder forum to address and coordinate the fight against GPV. This forum should consist of the various departments such as Social Development, NPA, Department of Justice, Department of Health, SAPS, Education, and NGOs that operate in the sector. I have also raised that the legislature as a body elected by the people should not fold its arms and watch a match it is supposed to play. We need to be actively involved in the fight. The legislature's Women Caucus Standing Committee has been trying to assist women caucuses in local municipalities to coordinate. Our local municipalities do not have functional structures in place to coordinate the fight against GPV. The responsibility to, to fight GPV must not only rest with women. We must use a whole of society's approach. If we say men should stand up and be counted in the fight against GPV, then it will be important to create a platform for them to be involved within the legislature. The Women's Caucus Standing Committee excludes them because it's only meant for women. A multi-party steering committee inclusive of men will be necessary. This committee must hold government accountable for actions taken to combat GPV, lead the charge on mass mobilization programs against GPV, and propose a range of legal regulator, re, regulatory reforms to strengthen the state's response on gender-based violence. On a deputy chair of chairs, while GBV, while we fight GBV, we also need to tackle the problem on all fronts. There's a need to empower women and the LGBTQIA plus community by addressing gender oppression, patriarchy, sexism, and structural oppression. Empowerment is the ultimate solution to problems that most women are facing currently. The DA agrees with the proposed resolutions that the government must increase and integrate the number of shelters and support services, particularly in identified GBV hotspots. I have spoken with MEC Fanta and proposed that she visits the Sarchi Bartman Center of Abused Women and Children in Athlone in Cape Town to see what her department can learn and possibly implement in our province. The center is a good example of how government can collaborate with partners to provide a comprehensive service for abused women and children. On our last visit with the Portfolio Committee on Special Programs, I observed that the Department of Social Development's approach to centers is, is, is coming when, 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 it, when it comes to centers, is already up and it, it, also, it, it only comes to assist centers that are already up and running. Meaning, these centers are, are put up by NGOs and NPOs who have their own objectives. So the department cannot really tell them what to do. The department needs to come up and build and start up centers on their own that they can tell them what to do so that they can address because we have little to no centers that support uh, women. There's, there's, there's a need left. to exit. Come again? Two minutes left. There's a need to exist a strategy to ensure that we start centers to address the need for abused women and children. Leaving NGOs to do it according to their own interest is not a solution. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, 
the DA supports the, mo the motion with the hope that government can implement the resolutions for the sake of all those who are vulnerable to abuse. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sbonda. EFF, NAN, UTM. Somlom, Kuplungo, Uguma, Ap, Sibesitet, Asikalang, Oklukunyezwa, Kwabantu, Kwalipondu, Lempuma, Kuluni, Kunge, Kondo, Ingetisayo. Simana siso tuga kwa sisiva izesu zo bulawa kwa bantu. No bulawa kwa bantu anangungi na lusini. Angati tina asina zizalwane. Iplungu inlela abantu baguti abapilangayo. Kwa lipondo lempu makuluni. Kunge komdu uitate la ngalelo. Nenlela abashilingayo emakaya. Abantu base nalando ya kutala. Yogbana indota indota emzinwayo. Abana yo ituba logunika abantu abasfazane amalungelo awo. Iteta ugutige eli pondo letu lempu makoloni kukona apo sisa silela kona. E kuseno gwenzeka kukona apo kufuneka sikosheli se kona. Singa paga mieka kusituwa kona kele kulindawo. <coughs> Lomku bage we GPV, no Klugunyezo Gwabantuanum, ne LGBT, LGBTQIA plus. Inga Gwazi Ugu Sombu Lulega. Gosobo Logbana, Abantu Baku Gwenda Oninye, Gwenda O Ezguzo Nagomas Pala, Gukutre Ingubo Yogbana Gwenzi, we e awareness campaigns. Gwa Bagia Bonagala, Indobana, Zikona, Ezen Zwayo, but as a Pumeleli. Kuya funega ge kuanjelwe kumako mkulu kwenzi wezo wangi nzame kubu iswe nendlela yoku uluwa uluwa pulo mteto kwingi nga yetu. Into mbi mandulo paya into mbi ya ikate ilo nichwa ngabantu. Noba ingwebe njani kusingabo sayo noba ikukusile noba ingwebe ipinga impatha ezi mfuchane kodwa ya ilo nichwa inigwa iziti masayo. Agu kondo eti abantu, besi, be, abantu abanga madota. Mabata, mabazi tatele kumzimba wanga zanzi. Kubandu besifazane kubabe siti bapinga imi pingo imi fuchane. Londo ienza indoba na besise isitima sabantu besifazane. Baya koji swango kwa neleyo abantu besifazane. Baya koji swango kwa neleyo abantu wana. Malunga nezinto ezinga, 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 <coughs> ezinga litishela. Kuzwe ngulo. Ezga litishela kuzwe ngulo. Ba kodwa. Kusa kubeleka. Ukuzwe ngulo. Inye into engaske yanzeke. Kwi pondu luetu. Na kwe South Africa yonge. Kukukinisa inga lo yom teto. Ozwe nguleyo. Maga, maga valelwe. Into longwini. Ubo mi bake bonke. Noguba Ushwengulega Ganye, Nobutle Ushwengulega Gabini, Oksala Yoku Shwengula Oko. Noguba Ubulele Oganye, Ubelinga Ushwengula. We are born again in Dobana, Egram and Wetuba, Oza Gushwengula. Maspaga many band to Bempuma Coloni, Maspaga many band to Bepondoletu. Lia Chabalala Ulu Chalaguti, Lia Chabalala by Chabalala Abanto Abapingaleo, Genga Yo Data. Oh, that I'm a bayazi, or go bana, lend a baya tail, or tatel in Gosami. My bayazi, Bacalelwe, Bacalelwe, Kumacas on the Belenwano, Bacalelwe, Green Bizo, Esipuzo, Bafundi, Sue, Nangamatota, Amatala, Emakaya, Ogoti, Lomshaba, Lona, Gumshaba, Nuele, we are Ella, our tatel, EUTM, Yau Casa, Ea Casa, Lemoshi, and goes. Ngoska Kulu, 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 Ngoska Kulu,
for those members who have not uh, apologized for this house so that rules apply accordingly. Thank you. As the rule must be implemented. Honorable Khabe. Um, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, uh, gender based violence and femicide is a pervasive and deadly social ill that plagues South Africa. You can't hear me. I can hope. And the girls are ready to be Oh, yeah, hey. Am I not audible? Honorable Anil Kumar. He is replacing Honorable Khabe. Once again, greetings from the wonderful organization, African National Congress. We are here. We. We as African National Congress, we believe in practicality. Whether it is Habe or Pile, we don't believe in gender. All gender we respect. And that's why Pile is standing here. I want to say that uh, this particular motion has been said. Honorable Sibonde, you supported the motion. Please keep quiet and listen to my nice speech. Uh, I want order, to say that... Order, Honorable Sibonde, can you respect uh, uh, the decorum of this house? Thank you very much, uh, Deputy, I mean, Deputy Chair of Chairs. I think fundamentally there are two things we need to say. Why the gender-based violence, we are worried. One, it affects the GDP. It affects the country's running. It affects the finances. Currently, the finances of South Africa is shrinking. And at that moment, again, what is happening when there is gender-based violence at this level is being emerging. Look. One case of prosecution, as per to the, to the lawyers and all that, it can even go up to 250,000, a particular case. This means it is draining the, the finances which is available for the country. Second one, it is actually causing emotional damage to the people. Remember, the survivor has to be taken care by the family. At that particular point, sometimes even the space, even the environment had to be changed. Schools need to be changed. Workplace needs to be changed. 
So there is an emotional cost. Emotional cost with the physical cost, if you look at, it is affecting the country's finances. So it is, we are not only talking about on a, something which is happening on an immaterial level. It is really happening in the sense that it affects the people's life. The second one, African National Congress believes that this country can fight. And there are two reasons for that. In 1913, when, land I mean, when the lands were dispossessed, that law was implemented. The women of South Africa started a march. And that march against the Native Act land, Native Land Act was actually spiraled our ignite or it ignited the freedom, uh, the thinking of the freedom of this country. The second one, again 1955, when our women were marching to the union buildings, they were showing that they had the courage to against a pandemic, they, they, against a system. It means that African National Congress believes that it is possible to fight against it. Then there are many acts. According to the Constitution, 1996, we put Section 9, Section 12. The ruling party insisted that these sections must be there. One, equality. Everybody should be equal. Number two, the freedom and security of the people. Both these things, if you analyze, you can see that African National Congress always was saying that it is important that we need to have these acts to look at it. Again, who did this men, uh, gender mainstreaming? It was the African National Congress. The first time in the history of this country, we said that we should have a ministry for women. Why? Because that will actually focus and it will refocus the welfare of the people. So I am saying that I don't have to talk much about what the ruling party has been done. All our conferences, all our conferences, if you take, it is clear that we are against this kind of a pandemic which affects not only the, a particular family, it affects the family, it affects the village, it affects the district, it affects the country. So I want to say that what we need to do, we need to train, we need to supply campaigns. We, you see, I, 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 when I was introducing this particular motion, I said that United Nations, when it is said, out of the 10 African countries first to implement this, one of them was South Africa so that there will be a training on that. So I just want to say that um, African National Congress, happy that today the DA, the UDM, all of you are agreeing with us in this particular motion. And uh, we want to say that, as I started with Oliver Tambo, he said that emancipation of women is by protecting them. And we believe that African National Congress has the capacity, so we say that African National Congress support the motion and the motion should be implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable <laughs> Pillay, Honorable MEC Manilusiti. Yo, what's on the graveyard? Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, Honorable members of the legislature and everyone present, allow us to add our voice today on this important matter of gender-based based, gender -based violence, which mainly affects our women. We amplify the need to address the alarming spike in gender-based violence targeting them. Well, in our province, we deeply understand this challenge. The distressing surge in violence against our women compels us to act decisively. We are making a rallying call to end gender-based violence in our province. Addressing this crisis demands education and heightened awareness. Our aim is to be a province united against this menace, building on prior initiatives we are rejuvenating provincial campaign, emphasizing GPV prevention, the significance of consent and individual rights. We are weaving GPV education into curriculums, advocating for respectful relationships, gender equality, and personal boundaries. Our government remains resolute in fortifying GPV laws, safeguarding victim rights, and enhancing safety. We are reaffirming our commitment to a safer environment for our elderly, women, and communities by ensuring interdepartmental collaborations for impactful interventions as we stand united against gender-based violence. We are embarking on an all-encompassing approach which is premised on the National Strategic Plan and the Provincial Strategic Plan on gender-based violence. 
we had Honorable Zubonda calling for a multi-stakeholder forum against gender-based violence. As a province, we have numerous rapid response teams on gender-based violence. We have the provincial um, gender-based violence um, forum as led by Honorable Fanda, which leads the implementation of the different pillars of the National Strategic Plan. Focusing on the support for survivors, reinforcing our current support systems at police stations, health clinics, safety centers, which is paramount. Um, also focusing on community engagements, active involvement with community representatives, which is essential by collaborating with local leaders and influencers as gender-based violence ambassadors. We aim to magnify awareness, mold public opinion. Our objectives is a network of community touch points for victims, partnering with churches, ikomkulu, ward councillors to stimulate community dialogues. On strengthening law enforcement, continuous training will be done on law enforcement approaches to gender-based violence, ensuring victims are treated with utmost sensitivity and professionalism. Given the unique challenges faced, um, especially in our rural settings, on um, specialized GPV units will be established in police stations, harnessing modern technology. We are initiating a centralized gender-based violence database to monitor and expedite case progress. Our healthcare system stands as a beacon of support. We are equipping every community in alignment with NHI, with professional trains to identify gender-based violence signs and furnish essential medical psychological assistance, upgrading our hospitals to meet NHI standards, ensures the dedicated facilities for gender-based violence, emphasizing their privacy and dignity. On economic empowerment, we are initiating plans to uplift those vulnerable to gender-based violence economically. By collaborating with the private sector, we aim to create job opportunities and training, enabling survivors to rebuild their lives. And rehabilitation and reintegration, investment in programs targeting gender-based violence perpetrators is crucial. By addressing the root behavioral causes and aiding survivors in their so societal reintegration, we ensure a comprehensive approach on partnerships, collaborations with the NGOs, civil societies, international agencies, and the private sector is pivotal. Regular multi-stakeholder assemblies foster knowledge exchange, address challenges, and craft collaborative solutions. In essence, a collective multifaceted approach is crucial to combat gender-based violence. By steadfastly implementing the above strategies, we are inch closer to a society free of gender-based violence. And part of this institutionalizing the implementation of the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and facilitating a realization of the six pillars across the different government tiers. Multi-stakeholder GPVF rapid response teams have been established with um, three local municipalities having established their um, local um, municipality RTTs. The King Sabata Dalingyabo Municipality has a gender-based violence rapid response team, the Raymond Mshaba Local Municipality, and the Amatole District Municipality. The purpose of this GBVF rapid response team is to ensure the localization of the N NSP and the Provincial Strategic Plan to ensure ownership and fair representation of the sectors and the subsectors. The active participation and maximum engagements of all the critical sector partners and stakeholders is crucial. We continue to build capacity, especially for frontline officials, as part of our work in the prevention and rebuilding social cohesion um, pillar of the strategy. Honorable members, sex workers remain one of the most vulnerable groups to the scourge of GBV. It is for this reason that we also held an advocacy session with 23 sex workers on the 31st of July with the objective of educating and dialoguing with uh, sex workers on combination prevention methods for HIV prevention, care support, gender-based violence barriers, and GBV. Secondly, the intention of the collaboration with the sex workers is to generate awareness on rights to boldly autonomy and gender equality, generate awareness and encourage sex workers to report and challenge violence create demand by sex workers on access to health services, particularly HIV, 
GBV and sexual and reproductive health services, and lastly, to promote linkages to health facilities. On the pillar of research and information management, the Office on the Status of Women coordinates a research team that comprises of the University of Forte, Nelson Mandela University, Walter Sisulu, the Eastern Cape Legislature Research Unit, the Office of the Premier Research Unit, Commission for Gender Equality, and um, SPU. The research team sessions are held monthly to discuss research needs of the province. To date, a research project has been identified. Three minutes and right, left. And the draft detailed research proposal has been developed and being finalized for submission for ethical clearance. As this research concept has been developed and presented to different stakeholders for a GBVF research seminar to be held as a build up to the 16 days of activism for no violence against women and children. Honorable members, we urge you all, especially those who occupy leadership positions in government, organizations and society, to refrain from making comments that trivialize and perpetuate the scourge of gender-based based violence and femicide. The scourge of gender-based violence and femicide can never and should never be made a joke. Statements that promote a sense of entitlement by men and boy children over women and girls that promote rape culture and objectification of women must be condemned with the contempt that it deserves. Together, let us shine as a beacon of hope in the fight against gender-based violence, making the Eastern Cape an excellent province. Let every individual here internalize the gravity of today's message. Let us jointly forge an Eastern Cape where our women are revered, safe, and celebrated daily. Your commitment, our shared vision, and collaborative actions can indeed shape a brighter, safer future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable MEC. I put the draft resolution. Any objections? Secretary, can you read uh, the next order of the day? A draft resolution, Ms. M. Mbonyana, disabilities. Honorable Mbonyana. Ms. M. S. Mbonyana. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, Obambele Nkulba Patiswa, members of the executive, Amalungu, Onke and Ryowi Sokengom Tetu, Intlogoza Masebe, members of the public and everyone who is following these proceedings through media platforms, Dumelang. Uh, uh, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce the debate on disabilities in the workplace. But before I do that, allow me to follow suit and wish both Honorable Garde and Honorable Konza, my Chair, a happy many returns of the day. Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs and Honorable Members, there are approximately 5 million South Africans that are disabled. This is around one in 10 South Africans, but despite this, less than 1% of people employed in this country are those with disabilities. According to the Employment Act in South Africa, people with disabilities are people who have a long-term or recurring physical, including sensory or mental impairment, which substantially limits them uh, their prospects of entry into or advancement in employment. In terms of the Employment Equity Act, people with disabilities are protected against unfair discrimination and entitles them to affirmative action measures. Unfair disability discrimination, honorable members, is perpetuated in many ways and can include the following setting employment criteria that excludes disabled people, keeping disabled people um, in low status jobs, inaccessible workplaces, lack of appropriate technical workplace support, inappropriate or non-existent training for people with disabilities, bias and stigma, just to mention the few. Honorable members, former President Jacob Zuma revealed in September 2011 that the Disability Act is being cra crafted to deal with enforcement, non-compliance, and implementation of the UN Convention on Rights and Persons with, on, on Persons with Disabilities. 
The convention covers areas such as accessibility, rehabilitation, participation in political life, quality and non-discrimination of the disabled. He also stated that, honorable members, in order to ensure the proper implementation of the convention, government was to develop a national disability policy and its implementation guidelines. To date, honorable members, a total of one million persons in South Africa with disability receives a disability grant. A strides taken by our government, which is quite inspiring, giving testimony to the caring nature of our society and the government of the ruling party. But honorable members, honorable acting premier, the experience that we have had with the designated groups tells us that they are more resolute, not surviving on social security budget forever. It tells us that they are more prepared to take charge of their lives and livelihood more than ever before. Honorable members, according to the research conducted, despite legislation on diversity in workplace, disabled people still do not experience the same access to work opportunities as do their counterparts with disabilities, without disabilities. The World Health Organization shows that employment rates vary across countries, but the bottom line is that all over the world, a person with a disability is less likely to be employed than a person without a disability. Past research has found that managers report that they rarely see disabled workers in their applicant pools. The Constitution of South Africa protects the rights of all people in South Africa. Human rights are applicable to all people. Therefore, everybody in the country is entitled to human rights by virtue of being human. Section 9 of the Constitution provides that everyone is equal before the law and has equal protection and benefit of the law. No person, honorable members, including the state, and private companies may unfairly discriminate directly or indirectly on one or more grounds against any person including race, gender, color, age, or disability. Section 10 of the Constitution further provides that everyone has the right to have their dignity respected and protected. As I dissent, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, it must be noted that there shall be no discrimination against disabled people, and they shall enjoy equal opportunities in all spheres of life, and they shall be protected against exploitation and all treatment of an abusive or degrading nature. Thank you very much, Deputy Chair of Chairs. Thank you, Honorable Sweetness Mbonyana. Honorable Zbonda. I have nine minutes. Better than support motion, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs. Let me greet once again uh, the Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, Acting Premier MSCs, members of the August House, staff and members of the public. Person, persons living with disabilities overcome a lot of challenges throughout their lives. Those challenges are physical, emotional, and social. When they have done their best to endure these challenges, they face another hurdle of unemployment. In sub-Saharan Africa, disability data recently collected by the World Bank through regular household surveys in Botswana, Gabon, Lesotho, Namibia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Swaziland, and Tanzan Tanzania, and Zimbabwe revealed Participating in the labor force is a challenge for persons living with disabilities. The primary barriers to employment include discrimination and lack of accommodation offered by the employer. Those who find work often get part-time jobs and are paid less and are less likely to be promoted. Unstable unemployment and insufficient financial resources can lead to many persons with disabilities being reliant on their families or social programs, which can put them in a more vulnerable position. The white paper on disability being a crucial step along the journey of improving the lives of persons living with disabilities and moves us closer to a fully inclusive society that brings all South Africans, to, that belongs to all South Africans and affords equal opportunities for all. 
it builds on the policies and programs that our government must continue to implement to make more positive and meaningful change for persons living with disabilities and their families. In line with the National Development Plan, the White Paper specific, specific prioritizes actions that require more than one government department or entity to work together as many of the barriers that persons living with disabilities experience span, different, span on different government entities. It is a call to action for government, civil society, and the private sector to work together to ensure the social economic inclusion of persons living with disabilities. Government must therefore seek to create a caring and inclusive society that protects and develops the human potential of its children. A society for all where persons living with disabilities enjoy the same rights as their fellow citizens and where all citizens and institutions share equal responsibility for building such a society. South Africa, like most countries, need a needs a very skilled worker to contribute towards the prosperity of the country. Persons living with disabilities can make a positive contribution in the workplace. It is generally found that a person with a disability develops into a well-adjusted productive worker in an atmosphere of acceptance and co cooperation and goodwill. Disability is a human rights and development issue, meaning that persons with disabilities should enjoy equal rights and responsibilities. Technological advances have removed most of the obstacles for persons living with disabilities in their aspirations to the careers of their choice. The only way to overcome fears, myths, and negative attitudes about the abilities of employees and applicants living with disabilities is through vigorous education, awareness raising, raising with the private and public sectors. Furthermore, experience has shown that persons with living with disabilities are the best qualified persons to be drivers of education and awareness programs by playing a leading role in creating awareness on disability issues in the workplace, guiding the development of all awareness programs in the workplace, becoming members of trade unions and any representative structures within the workplace in order to ensure hands-on disability awareness training. The White Paper on Disability also states the responsibilities of of all role players. It states that the executive authorities must act as champions for the promotion and protection of the rights of persons living with disabilities within the institutions they serve and as such are responsible for providing political leadership for the mainstreaming of disability across the value chain of all programs of the institution they lead. They must ensure that the policy directives of the white paper are translated into the cost programs left. within the institutions they lead ensuring that accounting officers are held accountable for disability rights mainstreaming across all programs of their institutions they lead, and ensure that platforms for consultations with representative organization, organizations of pe 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 persons living with disabilities are formalized within the institutions they lead. The Premier, as the head of the executive authority of the province, is therefore tasked with the duty to ensure that all department departments do comply with the requirements of the law to employ people persons living with disabilities. The excuse that we constantly get from departments when they fail to comply is that people do not declare their disabilities. At this day and age, we cannot be listening to such mediocrity when there is so much people out there who live with disabilities and are vocal about it. Our government is failing to engage suffi sufficiently with organizations that advocate for persons living with disabilities because they have, they, they have the data. Some of these people have been cap capacitated by the same government that fails to employ them. As an example of a partially blind woman in Kubusi village in, the, in, in Staterheim named Nonsigele Otos, who sits at home with her two kids also living with disabilities, unemployed after having been put through a lot of programs by the same government to capacitate her. All her certificates are gathering dust, while the departments are failing to meet the equity target of only 2%. The Office of the Prima both having achieved the set targets on employment of persons living with disabilities, but most departments under the Premier's leadership are still failing to comply. I implore the Premier to crack the whip and ensure compliance by the departments and executive must stay true to the mandate according to the white paper to hold the accounting officers to account for failure to ensure compliance with the law. The DA supports the motion and proposes an additional resolution stating that all departments through their MEC must submit evidence of ensuring that platforms of consultations 
with the representative organizations of persons living with disabilities are formalized within the, constitution, within the institutions they lead. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Responder. EFF, UTM, ATM, Freedom Front, Honorable Camelio Benjamin. Um, Honorable Chair of Chairs, Deputy Chair of Chairs, Honorable Acting Premier, uh, members of the Executive, Chief Whip of the Ruling Party, all Honorable Members in the House. I don't see anybody in the gallery anymore. And if there is any staff that is here, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, in response to the motion with disabilities in the workplace, we as the ANC are accepting the motion. Disability inclusion is an essential condition to upholding human rights, sustainable development, and peace and security. It is also central to the promise of our of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to leave no one behind. C the commitment to realizing... You are not audible enough. Is that better? Yeah. Development to, le to leave no one behind commitment to realizing the rights of persons with disabilities is not only a matter of justice, it is an investment in a common future. When it comes to the matters of disability, all designated employers should be reasonably accommodated the needs of persons with disabilities. This is both a non-discrimination and an affirmative action requirement. The aim of this accommodation is to enable the person to perform the essential functions of the job. The South African Human Rights Commission recognizes that people with disabilities can make up a significant portion of South Africa's productive workforce. We are also aware that the challenges impacting persons with disabilities in South African employment are more complex and challenging than in most countries because often before we give attention to disability, we have to prioritize race and gender and skill shortages. While a dedicated and focused approach is needed to position disability as a key priority, what is also needed is a mainstreaming approach for disability to be considered in all aspects of our employment. In South Africa, persons with disabilities are categorized under the following five impairment groups, physical, sensory, intellectual, psychosocial and neurological impairments. Section 69 of the Basic Conditions of the Employment Act 75 of 1997 permits a labor inspector to issue a compliance order in respect of non-compliance with these acts. An employer must comply with a compliance order with the time period stated in the order unless the employer refers to a dispute concerning the compliance order to the CCMA within that period. Section 6 of the Employment Equity Act of 55, 55 of 1998 prohibits unfair discrimination against employees on the grounds of disability or illness. This means that an employer may not discriminate against an employee merely due to the fact that the employee is disabled. The Department of Social Development is among the few departments in the province that has met the 2% target of the people with disability in the workplace. Audit access for people with disability is conducted quarterly and in our commitment to strengthen oversight, the department will be submitting quarterly reports in that regard. The department on a conscious basis, on a continuous basis, shares the advertisements with local organizations of people with disabilities. Again, during the selection phase of, of requirement, an empowerment equity representative form parts of, forms part of selection panel to share the equity status of the respective area and to ensure fairness 
with regards to people with disability. The African National Congress therefore accepts the motion. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Benjamin. Honorable MEC, Honorable Fanta. Ten minutes. Thank you, Deputy Chair of Chess. Honorable Speaker and the Deputy, Honorable Premier and members of the Executive Council, or members of the Provincial Legislature, HOD, Panom Pet, Associate Wedongo, and Senior Management of the Department, saying that we were the Koi, Kabe Fundis Vesel of Wetu, in courses of Wetu, Oma Manotata, Nolucha, City Kuni, good afternoon. Willie Sanga Kamili selling Kosim Yesu Christ. Honorable Speaker, this is a very important debate aimed at improving the economic status of persons with disability, especially in the area of economic rights. Economic status of persons with disability, especially in areas of economic rights. Hence, all inputs made here today are very critical and assist in shaping our policies. One of members, the principle of democratic society indeed acknowledges and protects the rights of all its citizens to be treated equally, regardless of race, gender, or disability, which were realized through the election of the first democratic government as led by the African National Congress since 1994. Mandi Chonditi, the person of the portfolio committee of ESOGDEV, the government is indeed in charge, is charged with the responsibility of translating these principles in reality by ensuring that through our policies and programs, the citizens reap the benefit of equity. In pursuing of its mandate in this regard, government continues to place equity high on its transformation agenda, Mama was born. Hence, this government, especially up in Eastern Cape, we have a portfolio committee called SPU. That portfolio committee is meant for doing oversight to make sure that people with disabilities are, are, are appointed, women are appointed, young people are appointed, not to be appointed, but they are in the strategic position. Hence, the Department of, 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 of Social Development, Utupe Sentimenzil, and all other departments now are rolling up their socks because that portfolio committee of SPU, that whenever the committee is Oshala, the report must be clear, where are we as women? Where are we as people with disabilities? So this government is not confused. It's very clear when, when it comes to, 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 to equity. Department of Social Development in the province that met the 2%, it is only now that all departments are changing. And when we're saying audits on, on access of people with disability are conducted quarterly and report will be submitted head, head forth. The department in a continuous basis shares the, the advertisement with local organizations of people with disabilities. Link with such organization will be used to create a database of potential candidates for post in the department. Again, during the selection phase, of recruitment and employment equity representatives forms part of selection panel to share the equity status of the respective area and to ensure fairness with regards to people with disabilities. Our premier, a typical example, in his office, when a manager has any disability, he has yona, he has that yona, he has demonstrating why. Where's that tall? Is back corner? Where's the meeting? Zit. What I? And this angle told in this over stall of Mna, Kobanazi, the Grizam, and the Pangil, Tetanjana, Logana Low, we manage over Senda Premier, Unemot, Oyakia, Kobel, Unen Ruyake, Goba, Lohudment, and respect Umto. To furthermore, 
strengthen our approaches, advancement need to explicitly target persons with disabilities by indicating that persons with disabilities will receive preference during selection. Eleno si teta yekba lamda na wani gu preference ba akakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakakak
Yuvile um de teta gas centers, gas safe homes. This government, we've got two Tuzela centers in almost five districts. Yes, I joke. A bay, a bay, a there's a safe home. A up with standard. Apo Ubasi Kubule case. Kalum Fundis Omotose. Dad Carolus Upa Placenta was drained. Pa Ubayo Quazo Mela and Opotose Kula court case. That it's a well standard safe homes. Our two to Zella centers where they play Bendi Pa and Bizan. It's a world class. Is to the center in Bizan, in Jalo, a Christian, who is named Bizoka President, in Jalo Paya. So as he has Baku Tobago said to Ezidin, as open I had no mamma's bond. This further ensured that we finally put to rest the notion that disability equity is only about setting and achieving numeric targets. There is much to be done to ensure disability equity in the department, including putting policies and processes in place, and is put up as part of a strategy that needs to be strengthened and create a commitment to put in operation such policies and processes in practice. We must not be here to grandstand the issues that are affecting our people, because that's what DA is doing. It is grandstanding Yes, serious issues that are eating our people. No, Why no, no, they no. are not implementing the Honourable, same policies? Honorable Zubonda, I'm not going to allow you to disrupt this house. Same DA. Proceed. Same DA. No, no, are you going to allow him? About my, 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 my. No, no, no. Don't argue with me. Is that me. even parliamentary? Don't Does argue she know if I'm me. abused or not? Don't argue with me. Does she know if I'm abused or not? Don't argue with me. I'm saying is she you are not supposed my abuse? to Is she behave. diagnosing me You as an are not supposed person? to behave the way you are behaving. If you had anything that you want to correct her, you were supposed to raise up your hand, not just to shout. This is not a shipping. This is a food. This is a house. The is the MC shipping gang. Proceed, uh, Honorable MEC. We are saying without shame that DA must not come and grandstand here with issues that are eating our people. They must not come and grandstand whilst in their own party. They are talking left, but they are walking right. It cannot be correct. Our people people with disabilities, they need us because are the most suffering. Hence, this government led by ANC, even the disability grant is higher than anyone else because this government understand who there are things that impede them. This government has got special schools more than the, the DA government that was there before or the apartheid government. This government led by ANC, they are world-class special schools so that's thing about college starting is about a point I have a fund is so with all the qualifications a see a bully look by need debate a cool up emotion yeah let debate God will call you a kaya was again thank you honorable emerson I put the draft the resolution any objections That concludes uh, the business for the day. The House will adjourn until Tuesday, the 24th of October, 2023, at 10 in Reinet, Dr. Bayes Node, local municipality, for the presentation of reports on, on pre-visits in Sarabatman District Municipality for taking legislature to the people to be held on the 24th to the 27th October 2023 at the Botanic Spot Grounds. But before I can uh, adjourn the House, let me allow the Secretary to make some announcements, very important announcements. 
dinner. <laughs> dinner is served in the members' dining hall. Um, we've also provided um, takeaway packs for those members who do not want to um, stay. Um, because and there's a very important uh, also another issue besides dinner. Also for the members who reside in East London, um, there is a report of a shooting around Apol in Berlin. Um, so members who are driving that direction are advised to approach with caution. As, um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Advocate, the House is adjourned.